We've been powering the American road since before it was paved. Our first breakthrough in motor oil was introducing it. And we've been reinventing it ever since. From the world's first high mileage oil to the world's first synthetic blend. There are those who change with the times and those who drive them. Valvoline, the original motor oil. The Falcon Azenus RT660 is the enthusiast's choice for ultra-high performance. Engineered for predictable handling and stability, the RT660 provides maximum traction both on and off the track. Your competitive edge has arrived with the Falcon Azenus RT660. Hawk Performance packs 100 years of friction dynamics into every product. Backed by Carlisle Brake & Friction, the world's premier innovator of industrial brake and friction components, Hawk leverages R&D tools and motorsports experience to deliver uncompromising performance on the street. There's no reason to settle for less. Choose pads that are race proven and street legal. Find the Hawk Performance Brake Dealer near you at hawkperformance.com. Here at FCP Euro, we take pride in the fact that each and every one of your orders is picked, packaged, and shipped by a fellow car enthusiast. We understand that you need the right parts and need them fast to complete that next project or get your daily driver back on the road. Take Roberto, one of the pickers in the distribution center and one of the key pieces to making sure the right parts arrive at your door. When he's not at FCP Euro, Roberto is driving his Mark V R32 to various car shows around the Northeast. When he's picking orders, he puts himself in your shoes and understands that you need the right parts to arrive at your door. So he takes the utmost care in making sure he puts the correct items in the box. To learn more about us, head to fcpro.com. For the third consecutive year, Gridlife returns to the place where the Gridlife Touring Cup made its debut event two years ago in 2019. It is time to go racing for race two of Gridlife's Midsummer Meet at Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. Hi, everybody. I'm Greg Creamer, joined by Alex Moss, winner in the Street Mod category in Time Attack and in, uh, in Track Battle last year. Great to have you with us again here and uh, really excited about this one. We had a brief race yesterday, but it was very event-filled. The battling at the front was absolutely intense. We had that little bit of contact uh, a little bit later in the race that ended up having it finish under yellow. So we've got a paddock and a grid full of cars, I think, that are really anxious to get in a full 15 minutes of high-test racing as they're queuing up. Yeah, I think so. I'm, unfortunately, we did have that contact, which has shuffled the grid order a little bit. Um, but I'm sure everyone's re eager to go and, and excited to have a good race this time around. Absolutely beautiful weather here. A nice, pleasant morning. I think we're going to see some pretty quick lap times here. It's nice and cool, and uh, we didn't get any rain overnight, so the track hasn't been washed clean, and uh, I think we're going to be in really good shape. Looking forward to this one to get underway. Second of four races. This one really critical here because the, the how you finish in this one will determine where you start in race three, except for the top ten, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So you got to get a good finish here. You could find yourself really just falling and behind throughout the rest of the weekend. That's right, yeah. So the finishing order for this race is going to set the grid um, with the exception, like you said, of the top 10. Top 10 finishers are going to go into a one-lap uh, shootout-style qualifying session to reorder themselves for race three. And we were talking about the conditions. How about this? Just got an update. Track temp sitting right in the 90-degree range. So it's just superb for these tires, and it's going to be a great battle. Today's grid was based on fast laps from yesterday and a couple of the of the players that had issues in the race did get some good laps in before that happened uh, so they're not going to be hurt too much by that that's right yeah everything um uh, you know because it's fastest lap um from the race one um even those that didn't finish the race if, as long as they set a good lap um they were able to to have a good qualifying position for this race um so so most cars are, are where they should be really and as you can see from this great drone shot following this track around, let's give you a look at the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. It's a busy place. 
It is two and a quarter miles. They pack 13 corners into it, and it is a twisty roller coaster ride. You can see right there, start finish line. That's where we'll do restarts, but the original start will come. We'll explain that. Turn one, fastest turn on the track, one of many. That is a blind uh, turn in under a bridge. The keyhole, huge. You got a late apex that get a run out right about there is where they'll be getting the green to start the race through that kink. It's flat out. Big braking into the section called Madness, up and over that S's. Right there is a blind turn in, another one right there with a crest right at the apex that drops off very abruptly. Uh, this place is packed with blind turn ins, big commitment corners, and you can see the elevation changes around the track. It is an absolutely superb driver's test. It's a driver's track, Alex. Absolutely, it's a driver's track. This is going to separate those who, who really drive well and are able to to hold that <laughs> high commitment, as you say, uh, from from the others, the ones that are a little more conservative, maybe. Um, but a lot of people know this track very well um, and are going to be able to take full advantage of it. We just saw Eric Kudela working hard to get heat in those rear tires as he was pitching that that Civic around pretty abruptly. He won it yesterday from pole, and that's where he will start again. Starting second, the guy who finished second yesterday, Tom O'Gorman, and a good, good weekend for him thus far. Then Luke McGrew will start up in the third spot. A couple of wins for him this year. Tom, by the way, has a number of wins as well. Luke McGrew, a couple of wins this year. Had a great run yesterday. DJ Alessandrini, one of those guys caught up in that incident, but had turned the fourth fastest lap. He will start fourth. Uh, Aaron Lichty comes in leading in the points. Lost a couple of points in that run yesterday. He will start in the fifth spot. Finished fourth yesterday. Jeremy Swenson with his third place finish yesterday. Closed up on Aaron just a little bit. He's only six behind now in the number 30 Corvette. The number... Uh, 14 of Emil Tab will start seventh. He had a mechanical issue in the race, ducked into the pits, came back out, but he had put in a pretty decent lap. Then starting in the eighth spot will be Eric Jensen, who finished sixth yesterday. This is a big one here. Starting in ninth, big shout out to Scott McGee in the number 27. Not only getting his first points yesterday, but his first top 10. Well done for him. And then starting in the 10th spot will be the number 13 of Ryan Upham, finished seventh yesterday. Ninth place finisher yesterday, Lewis Chattroop. He will start in the 11th spot in his number 26. Starting in the 12th spot, Daniel Howard. How about this? His first event, I think, is right here this weekend. First race, pops in a top 10 finish. Not too bad. Watch for him today in the number 188. Starting 13th. Due to a four-place grid penalty for instigating the contact yesterday, Andy Smedegard in the number 212, that Honda S2000. So he will start back. He's a multiple winner this year. Starting in the 14th spot, the 101 of Gary Gimbel. Starting in the 15th spot, the number 28 of Steve Pruden. Starting 16th, the 92 of Marcus Luttrell. Starting 17th, the 187 of Chris Adams. 18th, the 33 of Justin Lee. 19th, the 42 of Zach Lavoy. Starting 20th, the 202 of Jake Price. 21st, the number three of Eric Meadows. Starting 22nd, the number 113 of West Penn. Starting 23rd, the 484 of Matan Rosenberg. He had a mechanical issue in the very early run yesterday. He's going to be hungry today. Starting 24th, the 159 of Josh Rubenstein. Starting 25th, the 24 of Dustin Barty. Starting 26th, the 213 of Scott Robertson. Starting 27th, the 102 of Andrew Wark. Starting 28th, the 18 at Colton Wade. 29th will be the 261 of Brad Kasiba. 30th, the number 6, Ryan Kristoff. 31st, the 515 of Thomas Moss. 32nd, the 106 of Michael Criticos. 33rd will be the 898 of Brian DeFries. Starting 34th, the 541 of Seth Gable. 25th will be the 182 of Max Lupfer. Starting 36th will be the 34 of Austin Hertel, who's good, very quick driver. He had a problem yesterday, couldn't even start the race. I think it was a gearbox issue. And then starting in the 37th spot, the 777 of Ron Solomon. Here's the thing I wanted to mention. Smedegard, he was found to be the guy that instigated the contact with DJ. When they got back, as I understand, Andy, the, he didn't even start working on his car. First thing he did was go over to DJ and say, what can we do to get you fixed? I feel terrible about what happened. Let's get you up and running. They got DJ fixed. Then they got Andy's car going. Yeah, that's right. So as soon as the race was over, they came in. Andy and Ron actually both went over to um, DJ's pits and, and started pulling that car apart and seeing what the car needed. As soon as those guys were squared away, that's when... And he came and joined the rest of his team to work on his own car. Yeah, fantastic. Another story we're going to talk about, that kind of camaraderie once we get this race going and underway. But field now under the control of Eric Kutel as he's bringing it up. And right past that kink is where the green flag will fly. And we will be racing for race two here as we set sail. And there is O'Gorman, that blue and black Honda on the outside of Cotille. And we're green! Underway here in a big move again. Jeremy Swenson jumps to the outside. 
That V8 in that car gives him great torque. He's going to edge along. Now, can he close the door on O'Gorman? He cannot. We're three abreast into turn number four. That's why they call it madness. It's just insane running three abreast there. And there's still three abreast up and over the top. Now they tuck in a little bit, and it's O'Gorman. But look at this. Wenson not giving up. Finally, he tucks in behind O'Gorman. Coutil staying right on his shoulder. Coutil will have the inside line for the next corner. Great battling already. Coutil is through on Swenson. What a move. And look at Emil Tab moving up, getting by Lick as well that is the battle for fourth but Lichty right there on the outside using the little extra punch of that Cayman that'll give him the insight now into turn 11 this is just fierce stuff we haven't even completed the first lap yeah amazing stuff it's going three wide through three of those corners um, really impressive everyone giving each other room giving each other space and we've got Tom ahead uh, followed by uh, Eric Coutille and then Jeremy Swenson dropping back into third just a little bit of a gap then back to Lichty there in fourth. So we watch them now through that very fast turn number one. Boy, do you flow speedier. This is very much a momentum track. Oh, the big off. Does he gather it up? Cars diving everywhere. Looks like everybody got through. That was a big moment and a great save. It's still Tab sitting there in that fourth spot at this stage. I believe that's DJ Alessandrini that we've got. Oh, sorry, we've got Lichty in fourth, and then DJ... DJ in is up into fifth. Great run by him, for sure. There is a look. Look at this. Kutel taking a run at O'Gorman, working the outside. And O'Gorman had just enough clear going into Madness and into turn four. He was able to drift over and shut the door, but Kutil is hunting, and he is hunting big. Yeah, amazing stuff from these guys. These guys are, are fierce competitors, obviously, but but in particular, Tom and Eric are just the best of friends off the track and, and the best of friends on the track, too. Well, that's part of the thing, and that's what generates that respect when you truly have the, uh, the ability to respect the drivers you're around and find them friends. Last thing you want to do is get into some sort of incident. It happens. It's racing, after all. Here is a look at your point leader, Aaron Lichty. Uh, he's driven. He started the season in this car, then switched to his Mazda, and then is back with this one here. And you can see they're just getting a little bit of a break, clearing DJ at this stage. Yeah, and one thing we learned uh, over the the break last night is one of our team was went around and talked to some of these guys, and Aaron has apparently in his setup really prioritized uh, right hand corners for this track, and and in his setup made sure that that car can handle right hand corners, uh, even maybe at a little bit of expense of the left handers. Well, sometimes you work that, don't you? I mean, you look at the track, what's going to be the best here? Uh, certain tracks, you might even set it up a little bit NASCAR style with just that little bit of, of stagger in the car uh, just to make sure that you've got it dialed in and you sacrifice uh, the corners that uh, aren't, aren't quite working for it, but it makes up for it. But look at here, Kutil into the toe, pops to the outside. O'Gorman's going to protect the inside. Lichty looking to the inside of Swenson. Not quite enough there. And everybody holds station. O'Gorman eating a bit of the curb in turn four. That can un unsettle the car. Didn't seem to hurt him too much. But Kutil is just filling the mirrors big time here, trying to rattle Tomo. Not sure that's going to happen too easy. Tomo's a pretty solid racer. Yeah, yeah, he won't be flustered by having a car behind him for sure, especially a car that, that he trusts. Uh, one of the things that's, that's impressive to me is how much Jeremy's car, pull, or Jeremy Swenson's car, uh, pulls on on. Aaron Lichty at the end of that straight. Just at the end of that straight, he, he really seems to gain ground on uh, the car that's pursuing him. Yeah, I, I was noticing that for the first like two thirds of the straight, it looks like Lichty can stay right with him. And then right at the end, at just that little bit, which is what you want, obviously, uh, to give yourself a little bit of breathing room into any braking zone. Uh, we got Alessandrini in fifth, then it's Jensen in, in the sixth spot, Upham in the BMW up to seventh, McGrew who started in third, he has dropped back into eighth. He must have got shuffled back at some point. Scott McGee, who continues to impress here, is now up into uh, the ninth spot. And Smedegard started 13th, he's up into 10th. This is that crucial, crucial keyhole corner. You want a late apex and get a run out. And boy, look at Tomo, he goes defensive early. And you're allowed that one move. You can drive anywhere you want on the track, essentially, except if it's in reaction to the driver that's behind you. Oh, and Lichty, he got a great run out of the keyhole. 
and has been able to get through, and Swenson didn't have an answer. Lichty now up into third. Yeah, it looks like that, that time around, Lichty was able to hold that position as he came around Swenson, and, and for whatever reason, Swenson just didn't pull ahead right at the end of that straight like we saw last time around. Well, this will be interesting now to see if Lichty can run down these two up front. There's that little margin of about what? To call it five to six car lengths right now. O'Gorman has turned to 136.442. And that right now is, well, Alessandrini has turned to 136.440. Talk about close. That's two one thousands. Yeah. That's the difference between these guys. Uh, I'll tell you, I, it is just so impressive with this huge variety of cars, drive lines, engine swaps, the whole thing that uh, I'll tell you, these, you know, yesterday's qualifying, the top 11 were covered by eight tenths of a second. The rules makers got it right, no yep. question. Yeah, absolutely, and and there's really a, a couple of things that, that Grid Life prides itself on with this series. First one is the parity of the cars. They can have a wide variety of cars and not need multiple classes to keep things even. Uh, and the second one is the quality of the driving and, and the fact that everyone is is making it to the end of the races without, without incidents. It, and it's been pretty impressive. I mean, the original race here in 2019, the first ever for the Good Life Touring Cup, the whole weekend there was not one bit of contact. I mean, that tells you just how well everybody understands it. It's gotten a little bit fiercer at times, but everybody gets the big picture. And we, you know, told that story about Smedegard, who went after and just helped his his other, uh, his really his competitor, get that car fixed and going again. Nice run here by the 184 of Jensen, as he now has moved his way up and gone around DJ Alessandrini and Jensen now has moved up into the top five in the number 184 and that's that Scion FRS with the V8 LS power plant dropped into it and he's given it a good run here. Yeah he is and uh, coming through into the top five now he's got to be happy with that um, so I'm, I'm sure yeah he's very excited. And the other story that I wanted to talk about just real quick when you think about the camaraderie here as we're watching Kudel continuing to work over the back of O'Gorman right here is that of the 75 of Adam Jabay. And uh, Adam was uh, planning to race here in his Honda Civic yesterday, had an alternator issue, couldn't get to the start. One of the grid workers who also races in Time Attack Sunday Cup made a run to pick up a new alternator for him, come back, got it in the car. Adam started at the back today, in the uh, and he has already moved his way up a little bit uh, up into the uh, 33rd spot. By the way, we we're talking about Emil Tab. And uh, he was not able to take the green as Kudel now working the outside of O'Gorman. And if he can now square down underneath and O'Gorman had to stay pinched to the inside, that may have slowed O'Gorman's exit. We'll see what Kudel will be able to do here. And look at that, that side-by-side -side racing. Look who's coming up to join the party. Yeah, absolutely. As uh, these guys are fighting at the front for a position here, that's allowing Aaron Lichty to come Ooh. through and, and catch up to them. Big, deep move by Kudel at the end of the straight. And not quite enough. O'Gorman has been really good on the brakes down into turn four and was just able to out-deep Koodle enough. You can see Lichty was even showing his nose heading in there. This is getting feisty. Yeah, it is. It should be an exciting finish here. And we're past the halfway point. These races happen in a big hurry, folks. And that's why it's urgent. What I love about this is you basically have the start of the race in the first three laps or so. And then the finish of the race and all the middle stuff that sometimes can drone on a bit is gone. These are true sprints. Yep. Yeah, and that was part of the the um, the idea behind this as to how how do you you know not just do another endurance series but get sprint racing um, into you know grassroots club level racing um, and have those exciting sprint races where everybody is involved throughout the entire race. Now let's talk about something quickly here. When you win one of these races, you get rewards ballast, don't you? So right That's now, Kudel right. is running, is it is it 75 pounds heavier? I believe it's 75 yeah. pounds for first place. And then Tom will have 50 pounds because he got second place in the last race. Um, and then it reduces down from there. Um, and then at the back, uh, they actually get to, to reduce the weight of their cars to, again, stop people from running away from it because, you know, the, the goal of this series is great racing um, and and not to see a, a car or a driver dominate the series. Right, right. Well, tell you, we've got a great show coming up here with two of the cars that are carrying the most rewards weight. Lichty in fourth just got a few extra pounds added. And so he might be feeling uh, his oats here right now, obviously. And look at Jensen in the back. He's closed up on Swenson in the battle for fourth behind these guys. It's heating up as well. 
Oh, look how close Coutil is. Couple of pieces of, I don't, I'm not sure a couple of pieces of 28 bond paper would fit. <laughs> I think it'd have to be 20 bond to get through it a couple of spots here. It's so close and Lichty right there as we have five minutes to go. There you see the purple Corvette of Swenson running fourth and the, uh, uh, excuse me, yeah, of Swenson and then uh, right there, Jensen right on his six. There he is in that black Scion FRS with the red wing up through turn 11 leading into the carousel. You open it up right here and then the late apex and Jensen's gonna do that even more than most so that he can get that big V8 onto the hammer, but for him right now, he's got a V8 right behind him in that uh, little Scion. Yeah, it looks like uh, Jeremy Swenson's tires are just starting to go off as we see with those street tires. Uh, towards the end of the race, they start to fade. Um, they, at the beginning of the race, they generally switch on better and, and he's very quick at the beginning of races. Um, and then they just start to fade towards the end. Well, I'll tell you, Koodle gets that great run through one, gets up along, but Tomo always just protects, stays to the inside heading in there to make Koodle do the long way around. And you can run it, but you're covering more distance and if you're otherwise pretty equal. But now this could change things up. That's a double draft for Lichty. He's looking to pop to the outside. Koodle senses it, eases over. He's in, in front of O'Gorman, but now it's a breaking duel down into turn number four. Koodle works the outside and O'Gorman has to give way. Tucks back in behind. Oh, Koodle, a little bit of rotation at the back. O'Gorman, oh. big slide, hangs on to it. Wow, fabulous run. Now you see why they call it madness, folks. Yeah, fantastic stuff that for Eric to get ahead there. Um, both of them having to defend from Lichty as well, who added that extra dimension into that. But again, <laughs> yeah. good, fair, safe, and I'm sure that these guys will be uh, having the time of their lives. Oh, I'm sure the grins inside are huge here, and we still have three minutes, so that's maybe two to three more laps here, and Kudel in that hybrid racing machine, he really has it working here. O'Gorman's been chasing the handling on that S2000, and it's certainly not too bad right now. But as he really has to push, you can see that car dancing and moving around a little bit. Now let's see behind, too, if Jensen has an answer here in these last couple of laps on Swenson. He is all over the back. And Alessandrini not exactly giving up a shot at a top five here. Then that red BMW is up him. Then the seven of McGrew, again, who just slipped from his uh, third place starting spot, got swallowed up a, get, a bit. And then McGee once again. Right there, oh, McGee is now. That's uh, McGrew, excuse me, who's all over the back of Upham. So the proverbial blanket covers these guys. And here comes Jensen taking a run. V8 versus V8. And Swenson right at the end. That We've talked about that torque curve he has. But look at this. Not so much with Jensen. Jensen working the outside. Can he stay there? He did. He's got the inside up to the top of Madness. And he has cleared him. But here comes Swenson, carries a bit of a slide. That scrubbed just a little bit of momentum, and it was enough. And right behind him, Alessandrini is now taking a serious look. Boy, that has just turned into a multi-car scrap for that fourth spot. These three have cleared off. Now it is Jensen through. He's into fourth. Swenson is fifth. Alessandrini is sixth. Then you got Upham, and then you've got McGrew. Now the question here is, can Jensen, in these last, this last minute and a half of this race, can he run down that group in front? He's, he's showing some serious pace here. Yeah, he is, and he's uh, really going to be looking to make a charge through the field, but, but putting a stop to that is going to be this white flag that's uh, signaling the last lap of the race here. There it is. White flag is out. Final lap here. And what a duel we have seen up at the front. Oh, we may have some traffic coming into the picture as well. Yeah, I don't think uh, DJ is quite done with this race yet either <laughs> as he gets on the back of uh, Swenson. I would agree. Well, after the problems in yesterday's race, he clearly wants to do something here. Ooh, look at this move by McGrew around the outside of Upham, and he made it work. They're side by side coming out of the keyhole in this battle for the seventh spot. McGrew edges ahead, but now... Let's see if that motor in that BMW, it comes up on the pipe and he comes right back alongside McGrew. We're gonna have another late breaking battle down in McGrew. He wants to stay there, he does. Beautiful job by Upham giving that lane. You have to do that. And he does and McGrew gets through cleanly. So that puts McGrew now up into the seventh spot. Nice job by Upham. That's racing with a lot of respect saying, hey, you earned that piece of racetrack. 
I'm going to let you have it. And that traffic doing a beautiful job. Couldn't pick out who that car is, but doing everything he can to just stay out of the way, not affect us here. Although DJ is all over the back of Jeremy. I was going to say Jeremy might have got hung up just a little bit. Opportunity for DJ, but he's only got a couple of corners. How hard is he going to press here? He's going to try the outside. Oh, I don't know if it's going to work. Onto the front straight. Here we go. Kudo comes through, picks up the checker over O'Gorman. Lichty with that good run to third. Here's the drag race to fourth. And it looks like it is going to be. Looks like DJ got him. For fifth over Jeremy Swenson. Looks wow, like in the charge what the a line, finish DJ here. Absolutely superb. Great, great run. Yeah, Kudal, O'Gorman, and Lichty on the podium. Then Jensen, and then DJ getting the top five. Boy, he made that outside run work, and that may have gotten Swenson off in that last turn, that little kink at 13. Yep. If you're off to the outside, it gets a little bit slippery out there, and I'm sure those street tires were pretty worn. That may have been the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it could have been, and, and yeah, just pipped him at the line. It must have been. And then looking through the field, looking down at, at 18th spot, Austin Hurtle, who started 36th um, after his troubles yesterday, managed to really carve through the field and, and make up 18 places in the race. It's pretty impressive. Not bad for a guy. This is his first season of racing door right. to door. I think he podiumed in his very first event, too, didn't yes. he? Yes, he did. So absolutely superb run. And look at that. Scott McGee once again, his uh, first race, his second start, and he's got two top tens. That's a pretty impressive show. So Scott McGee doing the job in that uh, 93 Mazda RX-7. But Kudel, two w wins, two poles. Let's take a look here. And that means, I mean, he's going to start on pole again. Well, well, we have the shootout. We got the shootout. That's right. Top 10 now. Uh, we'll go to the shootout. 11th on back now is set, right? Finishing yes, order in this. That's correct. But then the shootout will happen, and that will determine where the top 10 start in race three. And then during race three, we find out the random draw and the inversion uh, for the front up to 25% of the field can get inverted for the start of race four. So uh, I just love how oh, this series just uh, – plus we got the rewards weight. That, uh, yep. a few, another 75 pounds going to stack on, on, on Kudel, another 50 on O'Gorman. It, uh, it just keeps things really, as you said, uh, fluid. Yes, it does. It and tries that's to. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Tries to to make it tougher for him each race. Um, but yeah, amazing racing up at the front from, um, really the t all the whole top five six cars were were battling the whole race and and doing extremely well. So here's a question for you: If your car is working really well right now, and you got to think the guys in the top five have to be pretty happy with how things are going, how much do you change the car for this shootout? and then have to get it changed back or with a 15 minute race are you basically running quali you know qualifiers anyway yeah i don't think they have a, a huge difference in setup between yep. uh qualifying in the race um and if i was one of those top five six guys uh, i wouldn't change a thing i'd just run it back the way it is absolutely uh wow what a race this is what grid life touring cup has uh, become known for to be sure and it just continues what a battle multiple battles throughout the field and we can't wait for the next uh, one coming up next we're going to see some time attack action and uh, we're going to have abe and adam will be taking you through those then alex and i will be back uh, be with us about be ready about 10 30. i encourage you to watch the time attack but be ready too because we have uh, at about 11 45 so be ready about 11 10 or about 11 40 or so that shootout's going to be happening. We're going to be bringing it to you. And that single car, NASCAR yep. style, single car qualifying, isn't it? That's right. So we get 10 cars. We get to watch the whole lap because they get the track to themselves to try and set that lap. An out lap, a fast lap, and then in. And as you're coming in, the next guy goes. So it's going to be great. You're not going to want to miss that. So thanks for tuning in here for this second race of four on the weekend for the Grid Life Touring Cup. We've got the shootout coming up next. But right after us, it's time attack track battle time here at Mid-Ohio. Today's coverage of the Grid Life Touring Cup is brought to you by FCP Euro. Every part you buy is guaranteed for life. Falcon Tire, competition proven performance. Momo, the official safety partner of Grid Life. Hawk Brakes, race proven, street legal. And Valvoline, 
Valvoline VR1, available at advanced auto parts stores. Still on this weekend for a little. <laughs> no, I'm in desperate need of some. <laughs> what about you, Jim? No, uh, my sister's getting. Yeah, dun, da, da. Da, the uh, wedding. She's getting married, so. When adventure calls, make sure you're ready to answer. Stable 360 ethanol treatment is specifically formulated for year round use, so your engines will be ready when you are. Ready, willing, stable. The next generation of auto detailing is here, where simplicity meets performance. 303 Graphene Nano Spray Coating. Get a year of protection from a powerful graphene oxide formula. A formula that sends water flying off surfaces, keeping water spots at bay. Go beyond wax, beyond ceramic. Graphene Nano Spray Coating from 303. The Falcon Azenus RT660 is the enthusiast choice for ultra high performance, engineered for predictable handling and stability. The RT660 provides maximum traction both on and off the track. Your competitive edge has arrived with the Falcon Azenus RT660. Here at FCP Euro, we take pride in the fact that each and every one of your orders is picked, packaged, and shipped by a fellow car enthusiast. We understand that you need the right parts and need them fast to complete that next project or get your daily driver back on the road. Take John, our quality assurance specialist. He's normally found in the distribution center quality checking your orders, but he's also often found out on track in his Audi TTRS, putting parts that we sell to the test, such as upgraded track pads and suspension components. John understands how important it is for you to trust the quality of your parts, whether at the limit or just simply going to the grocery store. If you want to learn more about us, head to fcpuro.com. Welcome back, everybody, to Grid Life Live. Uh, we are ready for track battle heat number four. This is Saturday morning. Day two. And drivers are out on track here in group A. Uh, uh, yeah, just kind of rolling out, getting our warm-up laps in. Seeing a lot of the heavy hitters I was hoping to see out there this morning. Yeah, weather's pretty good. A uh, little bit of a breeze. It's not too warm out. I would expect that if Ferris is going to go for it, uh, this weekend, it'll probably be right now. Yeah. Some additional rubber laid down on the track just before this with GLTC race number two. And uh, we're hoping that uh, he was complaining about a greasy track a little bit yesterday. Yeah. Hopefully that's been resolved. Uh, it seemed like GLTC times were pretty good. Uh, so hopefully the track's there. So uh, hopefully we can follow along with Ferris to see just how fast a car can go in class. Uh, he <laughs> already set the track record uh, in unlimited class and also the class record for track modified class yesterday. So he, he barely edged out James Houghton's previous record by 0.08 of a second. So I'm sure that he's really not comfortable with that. 
Faster, you know? though, is faster. Sure, but Ferris's kind of theme this year has been uh, – I want to beat it by, by a huge margin. So, it's and definitely one of the best sounding cars uh, oh, in glorious. the grid. Uh, but we've got a four rotor RX7 uh, not that far behind. Yeah. So, uh, really, really special Man. cars. The way that car moves off a corner is insane. So, also on track, uh, Eric Dewey DeWitt uh, working through some uh, mechanical things yesterday. Back on track here again this morning. Uh, as is uh, Nick Kors, who might have the uh, one of the highest horsepower cars in the street modified class this weekend with yeah, his uh, eighth gen Civic. That makes 650, you said? It's a lot. That's yeah. crazy. And uh, he's he's got an aftermarket ECU and a bunch of uh, exotic traction control functions. And oh. so he said the car's car's pretty hooked up. I, I'm excited to see someone really make an honest effort at street mod with a front wheel drive chassis. Absolutely. It's not really been a thing we've seen in the past. And and uh, um, even if he's just going after the the front wheel drive street mod records, there's a lot of there's a lot of room there. Yeah, absolutely. Especially given that you can run a 285 tire in the front wheel drive class for for street yeah. mod, the the door is open. Yeah. If you can put enough tire in, I think you can get the grip you want. Man, look at that car move. It's it's really awesome. <laughs> so Ferris coming around here, uh, making his way past start finish. 123, 425. So not uh, not faster, but very very close. Consistent at times with yesterday. Yeah. But. Uh, I think he um, he said he probably only gets one hot lap per session, uh, maybe two. So I would expect him to be cooling down here. And um, uh, if he's going to give it another temp, it may be a few more laps before that happens. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Rauch going really quick with a 129.601, as is Grant Walker, I think, improving further. Uh, 135.88. I was pretty sure he was in the 20s yesterday. But, uh, maybe not. Uh, also quick, Ryan Matthews, 132, 422, and Carswell with a 133, 143. And just as we say, uh, Nick Kors running well. Uh, you see him pulled off in one of the access roads on in between the, uh, or just past the keyhole. So uh, hope that car's okay, but he's in a safe spot. I imagine we'll stay yeah. green for the duration of this session. Grant Walker yesterday ran a 28.99, so. Good for him. Real fast time out of that Miata. Yeah, that's that's really, really quick. So, whoa, a little dirt on track probably. Dewey, Dewey taking those yeah. those apex. Subaru line. The Subaru line. Yeah, absolutely. Rally, rally, rally. Also in the session, uh, Adam Ulrich with a 136.945. Uh, Josh Hulka uh, running a little bit slower than yesterday, 136.707. Team Twitch, which is driver Brandon Ranvek, 136.596. Uh, off pace relative to Halka this event, where yeah. I think Halka just gets a tremendous benefit in, in just in straight horsepower. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean, that car's in the fours, I believe, or close to it. Uh, yeah, I Hulka's, think so. Uh, whereas um, Brandon's probably more like the 330-ish mark. Yeah, so that's guess. a stock uh, S54 yeah. engine. So yeah. at the at the wheels, he's probably um, low threes, I would yeah. guess. Yeah, which is a huge difference, especially in street class where, um, you know, there's, it's a very limited prep class. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think what we see here, too, um, uh, driver Tony Barber in street class in his Model 3 yeah. was very quick at Autobahn. Um, and that track kind of suits uh, electric cars. And uh, I was talking with him in the paddock this morning, and he was saying that, you know, they're looking at data between Hulka and himself. And essentially all the corner speeds are about the same here. Uh, Hulka just, um, you know, pulls away from him by a mile yeah. uh, on the straights, where the top speed on the end of the back straight is about plus 11 miles an hour for Oh, Hulka. my gosh. That's a deficit you're not coming back from. Absolutely. 11 miles an hour. Holy cow. That's a big number. That's a huge number. And so, uh, you know, with with Hawk's car not only being lighter but having more horsepower in the in the class, it's pretty tough. 22659. Oh. Oh, oh that's it. That's a big jump. Ferris just killing it there. A 226. Holy cow. Wow. That's incredible. 
almost a full second off of the previous record. Good this for him. Weekend. Almost a full second. Little little smoky on track. I don't know what we've got here. It looks like uh, that's Michael Omic. Um, hopefully, again, that car is all right. But uh, there is it, a lot of smoke there. It is a Subaru. He's not getting out of the car, so he must not be too terribly concerned about it. Uh, obviously, it's always best to stay in the car unless you are certain it's on fire. Looks, it looks very hot. Yeah. Well. Funny how track cars get that way. Indeed. Uh, but I would imagine uh, we're going to see at least a local yellow here. He's on the straight, but car's moving really quick there. Uh, wouldn't want the possibility for an incident. Good grief, Ferris. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, certainly one of the hardest working guys. Uh, Absolutely. You know, like we talked about last uh, yesterday a little bit, uh, generally speaking, a lot of those unlimited cars they they come with full teams you know three to five people at a, at a minimum and ferris is here essentially by himself maybe i think he has a helper as needed but certainly not bringing the crew that most of the really heavy hitter unlimited cars have done in the past yep and uh i i spent some time talking with him in the paddock yesterday and what he was describing in his car is um you know just continuing to refine the aerodynamic balance yeah. of the car uh, where he's he's kind of uh, teetering back and forth between, you know, too much rear end and not enough rear end on downforce, or yep. too much front end and not enough yep. front end, and so it's small tweaks here or there just to make the car feel as neutral as he wants it to be in order to go as fast as possible. Uh, I talked to him for a while at Super Lap Battle in April this year, where it was the first event with that new front wing setup, and uh, at the time he had an APR GT1000, which is. Uh, no joke of a rear wing. Uh, I think probably the largest, like, commercially available, just buy it uh, rear wing that, that you can buy on the market um, without getting into the custom stuff that he's in now. Uh, and he said, it, you know, it was essentially not even there. The yep. amount of front end grip that that car was producing uh, just uh, – and then he said, I talked to him at uh, Pikes Peak, and he said, you know, now I have the opposite problem. Like this, this new wing that he has from Cody Loveland uh, and Affinity Aero makes so much rear downforce that even that insane airplane wing he has on the front of that car is not enough. Yeah, not enough. And so uh, I talked with him a little bit about uh, these. The rear wing he has on it right now is a dual element. Yep. And if you take that that element, that second element off, again you you go back the other direction. So right. yeah, it's, it's it's really what we're talking about now is fine tuning, really small adjustments to make the car really perfect. Yeah, so you can change the angle that the that the cords on the I think both ends of that car sit. Uh, so you can fine tune that a little bit. I I believe he has the ability, although I don't. He hasn't obviously. He's still fine tuning what he's got, but he's got the option to add more front to that car yet. That's what I'm told. Yeah. So all the down. We have not seen the end of the evolution of that Corvette yet. Uh, Hulka running a 33.647. Is that an improvement over yesterday? 33 in street class. What? So fast. What is happening? Uh, Dewey DeWitt with a 32.145. That's, that's got to be pretty close to a personal best for him. Josh Hulka yesterday ran a... 33.696. So an improvement for him. And uh, Dewey with a 32.145. Ryan Matthews, I think fastest now in the street modified group with a 131.946, which is a little bit off of the record uh, yeah, the, from last year, just a couple of seconds. So Josh Hawke's previous record to this weekend, a 134.3. What an improvement. Yeah, a full second is big. It just shows that, like, you, know, you always think, like, that car's got to be at the end of its development cycle. And then he goes even well, but faster. Well, you know, the uh, the driver is never at the end of their development. No, and there's always something you can do to the car, too. It, you know, that never it seems to be a never-ending deal. So uh, about two years ago now, uh, Josh Halka, um, being a really intelligent person and, a, and kind of a, a competitor and thinker in Time Attack, was uh, 
inquired to Adam Jubay, uh, motorsport director, and myself about the legality of putting um, a Subaru S209 turbocharger into his car. Mm -hmm. He made a really compelling argument, and it was allowed uh, for the uh, competition going forward in street class. And uh, something that's interesting is that that turbo is, in fact, very expensive to buy from Subaru. Yeah. And uh, he, we've made some provisions in the rulebook now to allow people to kind of get to that point in terms of airflow and power without necessarily having to buy that particular turbo. Because I think from from a dealer, it's something like four or $5,000. It was a really, really large so amount. Silly. It, like, it's a nonsensical amount of money for a turbo. Yeah. And so uh, I think what he had said was um, he's looking to go to a cheaper option, even though he already has what he has. Sell that and one. And sell that one because there's <laughs> something, you know, that alternative is like, you know, one third the price. Right. Yeah. He can make his money back on it. Uh, and I, I think it's good that you guys changed that rule, allowing uh, more people to to be able in other platforms to be able to step up to similar points in in their car yep uh, and so uh, the, the the motivation was is that is that a dog it looks like a dog or a goat i think it is it fake i hope <laughs> i hope it's fake <laughs> um but the motivation was well if if the top cars have this horsepower potential because yeah. of this amount of airflow from a turbocharger for other turbocharged cars, can we open the rule to allow everyone else to get to that point without raising the ceiling? Because we think that the balance of performance in street class right now is actually pretty good. Right. And uh, you have drivers like Brandon Ranvik and Team Twitch who, uh, in uh, not every track, but f for the duration of the season, is a very close competitor to Josh Olka. Well, and, and street class rules would allow Brandon to modify that engine and make more power if that's what he wanted to do. Yeah, he uh, uh, he's got a sealed S54 right yeah, now. Potentially, that's the risk of of reliability, which I think is the whole purpose of that car for him. Yeah. Uh, so I understand why he may not want to, but if he really wanted to 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 chase Hulka at every track that we go to, and not just have that advantage at some of the tracks. Yep. He could, you know, uh, the class allows for cam changes and, and mildly built motors. A high compression pistons the, the and E85 and a there number of other things. To make more power and be more competitive at uh, tracks that he can't keep up with. I, I think the challenge with that car is that its its primary purpose is reliability and fun. Right. And, uh, it's a slippery slope when you start opening up that engine. Well, and he already has a you know a competition time attack car. Yeah, if he wanted that is crazy. If he wanted a car that uh, he could chase the pointy end of the stick with, he'd be here in street mod with his Evo. Yeah, you know it, it's funny that class as it's or that car as it's configured would only take a couple of small changes I think in order to, um, in order to be like fully compliant for the street modified class. Previously, uh, it was in 2016, he won the track modified <laughs> season championship in that car, and we're nowhere close to those times anymore. Ferris has really just raised the bar. Yeah, it's funny. What year did you compete? In that was uh, 2016, and I have no doubt that Josh Hawkins' times are seconds in faster than my street mod times and he's driving in street class right yeah it's amazing the the progression of development in every class here. absolutely uh i remember uh grid life midwest 2016 was my first event that i had ever attended uh as as grid life and uh, i r remember professional awesome was the first team that we are aware of that went under 130 in, in in any car at Gingerman that was, you know, a production-based car. Yeah, any tin-top production-based car. And now there are track-modified cars that routinely go under 130. I would venture to say that I would, be, I would be disappointed if a street mod car doesn't do that in a couple of weeks. You know, it's it's really hard to say. Yeah. Um, I think the potential is there, and I think the front runners of street mod, that's... They want it. That's what they want. Yeah, they um, want it bad. But I, I just don't know. I think the cars have the potential, but things have to go right. Spring kick off the track just didn't seem like it was there for record times. And Gingerman's a, a track that... Um, 
those records are so lofty already that yep. if everything's not perfect, it's not going to happen. Yep, you're right. Oh, man. We've got the uh, <laughs> drone pilot harassing the birds here. Chasing another drone, I think. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the, I think the records at Grid there at, at Midwest are very, very strong. They're very tough to beat. But yeah. I know that every street mod competitor is gunning for that 29. Yeah. He's going to feel really bad if he hits that bird. I mean, is he? I'm, I don't know. Maybe. He'll be all right. So uh, I think track cold here. We're picking up a couple of cars waiting on Time Attack B to release. But awesome performance by Fer Ferris Khartoumi this morning. Um, yeah. I have to wonder if if now the you know that that's done and he'll just put street tires back on and go for track mod times. I mean, he's already got that record too. That's true. Pretty comfortably, but no less. Oh, jeez. Uh, and I think you know him and Je him and Jeremy Swenson, uh, who's now a GLTC competitor. They were good friends and competitors when Jeremy was still running uh, track mod, and they're still good friends now. And I'm sure that uh, if Ferris is out of the car already, him and Jeremy are probably uh, talking smack with each other about how he, uh, how Ferris knocked him off yet another record. <laughs> so. Well, uh, interesting. I am in a Facebook chat with the both of those guys, and I <laughs> wonder if it's already happened. <laughs> hmm. So uh, in this this chat, actually, uh, Ferris yesterday said that he's doing 22s on Saturday, and that's what we saw. Yeah, well, there you go. Speak it into existence, right? But uh, awesome shots here from the midsummer meet, uh, enjoying some awesome weather, actually. Yeah, really nice day. Uh, really enjoyable night last night. Yeah, uh, had a lot of fun, uh, and it's nice because like it's not so hot that we have to deal with trying to fire up the air conditioner and all that stuff in the trailer. We just left the the doors open and and went to sleep. Well, you know great. what? Uh, last night I had to raise the temperature. <laughs> uh, I went into your house uh, that you you drove here yesterday and immediately was like, Jesus Christ, it's cold in here. <laughs> yeah. hey, what are you doing? You've never been inside Adams when both ACs are running. <laughs> uh, it's it's like an icebox in his. I bet you the temperature is in the mid 50s I, <laughs> if, if things are uh, at full power. I understand that like you're flexing on everybody. <laughs> I get it. I get it. It's fine. But jeez. I mean, it's it's basically a meat locker in Adams RV. Also, why... Why does any camper in the world have an actual ceramic toilet? It's a that's a great question. It's a real toilet. Well, uh, I can say, yeah, that's very convenient. <laughs> but the uh, uh, display piece inside my house on wheels is the crystal stemware. Yeah, that yeah. comes with the coach. Oh, really? That's like a that's a, a thing. Factory people, piece. people, not me. Someone paid money for that. See, feature. Again, I I thought you were just flexing on us. No, that's 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 factory. But it's very Abe, though. It is. I could see you being a a user of fine crystal. Uh, well, uh, when the time I warns, I'm going to wash those, and then I most certainly will. But I'm I'm now afraid that if I break one, I won't be able to replace it. Yeah, that's probably true. So group B, uh, rolling, out group B rolling out, Ryan Seiler running yep. really quickly yesterday. Yep. Uh, Second place in Club TR. Grant just kind of like out in his own league today, this weekend. Grant Davidson in his uh, purple Integra, kind of out in his own league. Uh, very comfortable lead in the Club TR class this weekend. Well, I, I think um, there is some really, really healthy competition between him and Ben Thorne. And I've been told that Grant is an insanely competitive person. Yeah. And uh, it just eats at him that Ben Ben <laughs> wins an event if if Grant is there. My understanding is that I think, uh, from what Ryan had told me, Grant has been to this track already this year. I think in anticipation of this weekend. Yeah. Well, so. you know, if you if you want to run fast, uh, it helps to get some practice. Yeah. So some of our drivers, um, especially those from the ASM group, largely haven't driven here before, and yeah, so I'm really I think surprised to hear that Andy. I, Who's Andy Smedgard, who's kind of like been everywhere track guy. Yeah. Has never been to this one. 
Yep, and uh, he's done one lap of America a number of times, and it's this that this event has never been on the calendar during one lap of America. So, um, you know, it's just not been on his calendar. That's crazy. But uh, I think maybe we're seeing a little bit of that inexperience um, in in lap time as well, because yeah, uh, Tamo and Katil certainly much much faster here in GLTC. Yeah, he's not where we're used to seeing him. So that car there on screen, Slumdog Millionaire, Kendall Samuel. Uh, last night, a friend of mine and I, we hopped in his car and ran to Walmart in Mansfield. And that car went by us in the opposite direction, clearly on his way home from a Walmart trip as well. And, uh, you know, you talk about how, oh, I, we want to keep street mod street cars. Well, Kendall's keeping his unlimited class car street car, too. Man, I guess. It's got a plate, so it must be legal. <laughs> Uh, legal is a loose definition, I'm sure, but I, I couldn't believe that that car was just ripping down some random back road on his way back from what was likely some sort of grocery run. It's important. You got to make that run. I love it. So cars coming by now on their first hot lap of the session. Uh, I would expect some fast times here. It looks like Ryan Seiler's chasing. Um, we got. Graham Gaylord back as well yeah. in the C8 Corvette. I haven't seen that car in a few events. Uh, the Paragon Performance car. Uh, if you're a C8 guy, definitely look them up. So uh, for for any history buffs of the Grid Life Track Battle Series, uh, I drove in 2016 in a car that uh, made an okay amount of horsepower, but externally was completely stock. No aero, no anything. Yeah. And it was, I would say, really subdued relative to modern Street modified cars. Certainly not pushing the limits. Of and the class rules. Uh, that was in 2016. Graham, the following year, uh, came with a Subaru STI that made, I think, probably 200 more horsepower and started the trend of increasing the aerodynamic ability of cars. And I think really paved the way for um, the trajectory of the class uh, starting in 2017. Yeah. I, he does still own that car, I believe, but yeah. has been busy playing with uh, C8 Corvettes. I can't say I blame him. It's, I, I really like the white ones. I think I, they're nice. I like all of them. I think they're great. I'm, I'm not a fan of that sky blue color. You know, I kind of really like it. I don't. Uh, they make a brown, and I don't even like brown cars, and I'm kind of into it. Uh, the, I think the black ones are also very nice. A brown Corvette's kind of funny to me. So, uh, let's see. Where is... Kendall. 137. 137. That's that's getting along. Uh, I learned that Patrick Darty is not driving his Type R in Time Attack. He's driving an M3. So 139, oh, 629. Really? I don't know why, because that's the Type R is also here. That's no fun. That's not what we're looking for. Tony Barber with a 135, 625. Large improvement out of his Model 3. Uh -huh. Not that far behind... Um, uh, Josh yeah, Alka. Josh and Brandon. And will likely be pushing for podium slots by Which the end of the awesome. weekend. Uh, just another you know, demonstration of electric car performance here in Time Attack. I'm not sure where he's charging. Do you know if there's a do you know if there's a charging station here? I don't think there is. I haven't seen one. I don't know. We'll have to talk with him about that. Just getting towed up and down the road, regenning? Maybe. He just, just have to plug in. Life We've before. got RV uh, 50 amps up. That's true. There is 50 amp here. Most pro tracks have 50 amp. It's kind of a, a NASCAR and IndyCar requirement. Yep. Now I don't know this driver, but I saw him uh, parked over by our tech shed working on stuff today. That uh, is a really good looking Civic Type R. Mm. Looks like a black flag for the FC of Matt Williams. Matt Williams. Naughty, naughty. He's probably thinking to himself, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Williams uh, has a really interesting history in cars. He used to drift at like a semi-professional level. Matt Williams is full of awesome yeah, like, so yesterday he showed me what had to be a 15-year-old picture of him and his wife and another friend of his and his wife and Vaughn Gittin Jr. Because apparently they used to hang out with a, 
pretty regularly. And he even sold, apparently, they used to rally together. Who knew? <laughs> and he sold an 86 rally car that he had to Vaughn. Weird. Many, many, many moons ago. Weird. Yeah. Uh, I also know that um, uh, Matt Williams lives very, very close to the Tale of the Dragon yeah. and uh, has for a long time been a photographer for Kilroy.com. Yeah. And uh, that's just kind of what he does. It's a very strange thing, too. Now, apparently, he's retro modding uh, or resto modding Broncos. Works for a shop that resto mods Broncos. Neat. Yeah. Sometimes it's really amazing, like some of the backstories of some of the grid life uh, regulars. Absolutely, and so like even hearing Adam talk about the, you know, the origins of grid life and for how long he's known, you know, folks that we see in the paddock all the time. Yeah. Like, there there are some people that have been coming to these events in some capacity since they were like 17 or 18 years old, and now they're like 30. 40. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Adam and Chris. Uh, the two, the Grid Life founders, have been doing track days for almost er, over over 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. That's crazy. And so, like, I think about my own entry into cars and motorsports, much more recent by comparison. Yeah. So, um, you know, my first day on track, I think, was 2014, which now is a long ago, but it seems not. I not mean, it's, it's not. It's 20. not that much experience. It's not 20 right? years ago. You really dove head first into it, though. Yeah, I spent um, all the money, <laughs> all of it. That's, uh, I, you know, I know a lot of people. There's a lot of people here today with a very similar story. Yeah. So. That's a clean-looking Subaru. Yeah. Uh, ben Lynn moving in there, 136.2. He's getting up there. There he is there in the running out of the screen. Um Pretty, pretty decent time trying to move in there. Uh, not the 33s we he's probably hoping for to, to catch Hulka, but yeah, he's but he's gonna need a few seconds. Um, hopefully, he's using some kind of uh, data system. In uh oh, order to, uh, oh boy, oh oh, just, it looks like he was just trying to stay out of the way. Well, that's that's I nice. can appreciate that. Letting the loudest car here go by, uh, the S4. I won't say it sounds good. I will say it sounds loud. I, you know, so we're we're paddocked across from them, and it's. I'm not saying it's quiet, but either I'm getting used to it, or it's, got, or they did something to quieten it up a little bit. Uh, so we've been talking on air about how awesome the sound of the four rotor is on uh -huh. track. Uh, I can say in earnest that that same <laughs> sound in the paddock is not great. No, it's less. And uh, less the sound. ASM crew is parked right behind Logan. And what they did do was buy an air horn for <laughs> Logan and said, please, you know, please just ring this uh, when you plan to start up the car to give us some warning. That's fair. That seems reasonable. That, Perfect. Uh, that's reasonable. a good compromise in the paddock, I yeah, think. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody just put their earplugs in. Because it's it's not that it sounds bad. It's just it's just sounds it's it's a lot of sound. really loud. It's, it's like it's, uh, it's pretty close to like bust your eardrums. Yeah, line. it's idle and just barely above idle are pretty brutal. Yep. My daughter was not a fan. Well, she'll get used to it. Uh, or she'll be deaf. I don't know. I mean, I went to my first drag race when I was two weeks old, and I can mostly hear. Yeah, well, that you know, she's, got to, uh, she's got she's got little baby earmuffs. Yeah. Um, but she uh, if if left to her own devices, she'll pull them off. So uh, what we've learned is if we hold her hands and walk with her, she'll keep them on, and that's great. My five-year-old will wear his. Oh, that's nice. Pretty com uh, His favorite thing is for when he puts them on, I'll be talking to him, and then as soon as he puts them over his ears, I just start moving my mouth, and he thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> so uh, I can't hear you. Yeah, okay, whatever, dude. Chris Bickford in Street GT now running a 135.742. How close is that to Kobe Shields' record? Street GT record right now, uh, previously a 32.8. My goodness, Kobe Coming. going quick. Yeah, yeah. He's here this weekend as well, but not in his Street GT car. He's co-driving uh, with uh, Street, uh, excuse me, Club TR, TR driver Jacob Bodenauer. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a, just a really fast time. Yeah, it is. 
And what's what's interesting is that I would say that that Chris Bickford is no slouch behind the wheel. Yeah. And the levels of prep between the two cars is not that different. Kobe's car was relatively accessible and yeah. simple. Yeah. And was uh, that a, a SS1 LE Camaro? It was. Okay. Yep. And uh, just a couple of bolt-ons, and it made okay power. But uh, Kobe can drive. Yeah, clearly. He uh, he sold that car to um, a friend of his, and now is without a race car. And I expect that that is going to change at some point within the next twelve months. I mean, I can only hope. Uh, no race car life, as you and I are painfully well aware of, is less fun. It's well, certainly cheaper. But less fun. Unless you buy a motorhome. <laughs> well, I don't have either, so. I think you should uh, you should really get going on spec Alero. I'm waiting for that. Uh, yeah, Jesus. That was a, that was a silly class idea too. <laughs> and I was afraid that people were actually going to bike. Well, you may have it. missed your moment. I don't know how many Aleros are uh, in running well, and riding so condi condition. We had we had rules that would allow basically any. J body, which would be uh, Cavalier or Sunfire, Oof. or N body, which was Alero Grand Am. Uh, I feel like there was one other N body platform. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, that would work, and it, <laughs> that was, it was such a silly idea. You're full of those. Uh, yeah, Ryan Siler with a 38.9. How close is that to what we've seen top times so far? Well, Grant's well, Grant running a, a 137 just in this session, so still certainly behind him. Um, but got a Corvette parked here on track, so I would imagine. Oh, boy. A little, a little smoky. So Grant able to just barely improve his times from yesterday. Yesterday he was a 37.475, so just a tiny little improvement for him. So checkered flag, I imagine that we'll have to uh, get a tow rig out to pull that Corvette back out into the pits. I think in the next session we will have another orange Corvette if all things have gone well. We thrashed real hard on Dalton's car last uh, yesterday. Uh, but I think I think we're there. Well, that's I good. I think we've won. Well, the whole front end of that motor was tore off. It's it's been my experience that a race car is never fixed, and it is never finished. Oh, gosh. It's always just not currently broken. <laughs> uh, not broken enough that he can't race at least. So I see Matt Williams, who we we mentioned was black flagged earlier. I see him in pit lane right now uh, and some people kind of crawling over the car, but I'm not sure what or why. Checkered flag means he's not going back out anyway, so he just as well. Take uh, head to the paddock. Yellow flag as well for anyone uh, remaining on track, coming around on a cool-down lap with a uh, car parked out on the racing surface. There's my good friend Josh Fettis, our team mechanic, and his silly stretched uh, imitation Grom. Also RV enthusiast. Yes, yes, former RV enthusiast. He's not currently living the RV lifestyle. Well, you could still be an enthusiast. But yeah, that's fair, that's fair. But last year at COTA, uh, Adam Jabay and I of the Slip Angle podcast did an entire show about Spartan chassis RVs, <laughs> yeah, uh, for which Josh was a guest and a re like an expert. Yeah, he did own one of those. So uh, if if you're listening to the show and you're wondering why uh, Grid Life and and Adam and Abe here have an obsession with RVs, is because uh, we spend a lot of time traveling to events and at events on an annual basis, and uh, it it's really <laughs> nice to have your house uh, at the track. Yeah. Crowds seem to be enjoying themselves. What a beautiful day to be at a racetrack. Indeed, I think there's a chance of rain around lunchtime and. Uh, well, actually, it's uh, it says there's a there's a possibility of rain between three and six, which means that I'm gonna have to go to my RV and pull my slides in because they're a little leaky. 
Ah, bum deal. I know. So I was talking to a local here uh, yesterday, uh, a friend of, of Greg Creamer's apparently, um, who uh, I guess you can, like, for the for mid-Ohio, you can buy, like, a season pass. They said it was $300, which isn't a terrible sum of money. Uh, and you can – essentially, you have access, like, spectator access to any event that happens at mid-Ohio. Oh, that's neat. Uh, like, you know, regardless of who it is. So there are some people who are here today uh, who just have member passes. He said there's there's a, there's a, a small group of people who essentially spend every weekend that there is an event – here just hanging out just come they come to watch races every event that sounds almost. lovely uh and i think that's really really cool yeah i mean this is just an awesome place to be and uh it's what if it's what you like to do why not yeah three hundred dollars for you know because that'll get you into the indy car race the nascar race all IMSA. the si- imsa races all the silly little uh club event races uh SCCA runs regularly here. Uh, I think they've even had runoffs not that long ago here. Um, that's a that's a steal of a deal. Agreed. Three hundred bucks. Just don't flip it over, man. So uh, I've been riding my my um, <laughs> vin- vintage BMX bike around the paddocks uh, most of the weekend, and and uh, one of the challenges of running this event is. Uh, timing and scoring and where we are yep. in the production booth is on the infield side of the track, uh, but pit out and access to the paddock and the race cars is on the other side. Yeah. And sometimes the transition time is actually very short. And uh, to walk, you can do it. It's not that far. It just takes a lot of time. Right. So uh, being able to, to just jog back and forth on the bike has been, been really great. Yeah, I'm here with an electric scooter this weekend, and I've put some mileage on it. Oh, I have no it's doubt. so nice to have, though. But... Uh, gravel here on the infield. Yeah, that has a Not well great for me. your scooter. No, that, uh, there is an upgraded version with air tires and suspension, but that's not the one. You, you got to get on that. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I think now we're waiting on Time Attack C to release. Still, probably just a little bit of cleanup. We don't see Matt Williams in the pit lane anymore, but uh, we will get going as soon as we get the release from the false grid. Looks like we're pulling a Corvette now, and uh, hopefully that car is okay. Yeah. Gold Pass Track Mod competitor. I don't know that we've really seen him before this year. Well, I mean, we've seen him. He's been in a lot of events this year, but I don't know that he's really competed in grid life in years past. Not to my knowledge. And, uh, you least. know, you, you kind of get used to, to cars and sometimes even driver numbers Yeah. Um, when you start calling a number of these events. But uh-huh. uh, that one's, I think, new this year. I just think it's it's cool. Like, you know, he somebody we're not at least instantly familiar with, and he's Gold Bass. Yeah. The like, um, the, the acceptance rate for Gold Bass right this in. year was <laughs> was really strong, and, and grid life is very uh, 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 grateful and thankful for the the support. The last couple of years uh, for everybody has been challenging, and uh, I think people just want to do track stuff with their buddies. Uh, there's Gold Pass for HPDE too, as well. That's right. There? Yep. That, that's cool. So we've got. I don't know if this is uh, Kobe or Jacob driving this session, but going out on a track here, uh, kind of the the lead car. So that should be fun. Good place to be. Another PhD Racing Supra. Yep. They've really kind of been the leaders. In there's, uh, there's a lot of cars in the paddock with PhD teams on, or uh, stickers on them. It's a, uh, it's a program led by uh, Jackie Ding and his uh, partner Alex Lee, mm-hmm. and uh, they're they're building race cars and they're making people faster at the track. Um, between sessions, reviewing data, doing some driver coaching. That's kind of just part of the affiliation with the team. Yeah, and everybody's getting faster. That's so cool. I love. They they are like the embodiment of time attack. They, uh, some insane schedule for them this year. Uh, Twenty some events. Yeah, every single like basically every single big time time attack event in the country, regardless of organization. Yeah, and I think he texted me uh, at one point his schedule. I'm gonna look that up while we talk here, and uh, just see what's what's remaining on his calendar this year. Let's see. Uh, we are. 
Oh, he's deep into the schedule already. He's yeah. got uh, – we're here at Mid-Ohio. Uh, he'll be in two weeks at Hardland. Excellent. Um, and uh, then uh, Midwest Festival and then Road America and then expected to go to Button Willow. <laughs> Super Lab Battle with Global Time Attack uh, at Button Willow, one of the OG Time Attack events in the country. Certainly. Very, very fast track, um, yeah. long lap, um, hard to do well. Yeah. I would say um, that's kind of the, you know, the original time attack benchmark, at least certainly on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And it's been largely um, between uh, Button Willow and now more more recently Gingerman, those two class, uh, cla excuse me, tracks kind of being an East Coast, West Coast representation of time attack yeah. and what is fast is fast, you know? Lots of uh, grid life competitors here this weekend who have made the trip to Button Willow to participate. It's a long drive, I'm told. <laughs> yeah. Even just going to the mountains is a long drive, and that's past them. So, And I think that's kind of uh, in the middle of nowhere. That's not a destination track like Bikes Peak International is, where you, you know, you've got the mountains and some interesting stuff around it. So, so I'm, I'm – oh, Whoa. Boy. Saved it. Oh. Awesome. Just barely. Subaru's doing Subaru things. Taking the Subaru line. Going to be a lot of gravel to clean out. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I bet he's grateful. <laughs> Code Brown. I didn't see who Subaru, I, whose Subaru that was. I think that may have been Mike Coons. Okay. So I'm going to speculate to say that that's Kobe Shield driving because uh, it's looking looking pretty aggressive driving there. Really chasing that, chasing that Porsche, looking for that opportunity to pass. Yeah, I think the move here would be to slow down, yeah, looks create like a gap, doing. and like then uh, away, come around quick. on a hot lap and do so without any obstruction. That looks like that's exactly what he's doing. Let him. Clearly, he was not on it coming out of that straightaway or coming into that straightaway there, just kind of letting that really good-looking Porsche get some space on him. I can't say there's a whole lot of bad-looking Porsches. I mean, I'm very partial to him, but most people seem to hate the Panamera. I. Old Panameras, not so much. Uh, New Panameras, oh big no. fan. Oh, oh Dalton. No. Dalton, my, my... I don't know what it is about orange Corvettes, <laughs> but it's not been good for them at Mid-Ohio this weekend. That's, there's a lot of smoke coming off of that, too, which is extra scary for me right now. Uh, hit fire suppression system for that car sitting on his front step at home. Just delivered right after we left. Oh, so, shoot. You know, classic. Looks like... Um, he he pulled off and way into the uh, inside corner of turn one. Uh, we got the uh, flagger here at start finish holding all the flags actually oh yellow geez, and debris, debris black, and yellow. black. <laughs> that's talent right there. Three flags and two hands. That's talent. I so hope black flag all everybody coming in, in that process. You know, the debris it, flag. I'm we're kind of sure. speculating here, but uh, it looked like he was probably five or ten feet away from the wall. Yeah. I would be quite surprised if he made contact. Gosh, I hope not. That's the last thing I need this weekend. <laughs> it's to fix his car again. Well, if it's in, if it found a wall, it's, I doubt it's going to be fixed. But it's his birthday, and anybody who knows Dalton, <laughs> if that car's done for the weekend. All right, so so we just got uh, word from our production team that neither car made contact. It's just a little bit of cleanup here. So uh, cars coming back now into the pits and waiting on a little cleanup. Always something. It is always something. <laughs> well, I mean, you have a number of cars here. I think we're approaching 100 cars in time attack this weekend. Yeah. You've got that many drivers pushing that hard. Um, you know, you're you're bound to have uh, a few cars that, you know, find the limit. And in this case, the limit might be a horsepower. It might be the limit of the connecting rods. You never know. 
think we're just doing a little bit of uh, track inspection here to make sure that the track is clear of anything that's slippery. Getting text messages from friends. Dalton's car just erupted in smoke and he pulled off track. Got it. So hopefully it's nothing. Hopefully it's just something simple that we missed and he can, we can put it back together. Well, I know you were looking for something to do tonight. Now you found it. You know, that's not what I was looking to do tonight. <laughs> Peter Zhang with a 139.290. Um, I, I learned that uh, yesterday uh -huh. uh, we saw him off track. It was because uh, he lost brakes. And, oh. Uh, yeah. Got the a, worst thing to lose, frankly. Well, on uh, on a racetrack, it's, <laughs> not, it's not what you want to lose. I mean, even on the street, that's the last thing I'm looking to lose here. Got Lisa Keys on screen here in the car lovingly known as Lil Red. Uh, she loves driving that Civic and uh, has a great, great time on track. And like uh, instructor? Really, really sharp cookie uh, outside of uh, the track, but started, I think, just a couple of years ago in our uh, beginner group and rapidly progressed and is now one of our primary instructors. Yeah. Just kind of a natural talent. More girls on track is great. I know that uh, it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for beginner uh, for there to be females in the beginner classes. Um, and I think it's cool that they have the opportunity to have a female uh, instructor. I think that makes things a little easier. I think it can be for I, some but people. Uh, I would say uh, this is probably true for everybody coming yeah. to a track. Um, you know, if you don't already have a core group of friends that go to the track, it can it can be intimidating yeah. to, to just go that first time before you know anybody. Yeah. You know, myself included, um, you know, signing up, going to an event when you don't know anyone, if you're not an outwardly very social person, that, that can this be a guy. little overwhelming. Yeah. And uh, uh, I can say just from my own experience, you know, being willing to take that plunge, especially in this paddock and just, you know, commit to getting to know new people. Um, you you're generally really rewarded because everyone in the paddock is super friendly. Yeah. And uh, it's not hard to to make friends. Just go talk to a person that has the same car as you. Yeah. And it's a good way to learn, and it's a good way to get up to speed on track really quickly. Greg made comment that he thinks this might be the the youngest average age paddock in the country, possibly the world. That that could be true. Which is kind of interesting, you know. I, you know. Uh, Grid life is kind of so consuming of my time that I don't get to many other events that aren't grid life anymore. Um, so, you know, I can see that. It's, but it's it's interesting. I know that's always been grid life's goal is to bring uh, racing to uh, the younger crowds and make sure that it's something that continues to exist well into the future. Um, but when when someone like him says that, like it's clearly working. Yeah. Um, having that kind of propagate long term and I think Adam's big vision for GLTC was to be able to showcase uh, wheel to wheel racing to a younger audience mm -hmm. and also make it available and accessible for people who want to get into the sport of racing Yeah, and so um, regularly we'll hear requests for additional classes within uh, our wheel-to-wheel -wheel, uh, series, you know, more more power-to-weight options and things yeah. like that. But I think uh, the beauty of GLTC is the fact that it is it is low how, uh, lower horsepower in terms of race cars, and that I think does make things more accessible because um, generally, as you add horsepower, what you also do is just add cost. Yeah, uh, burning brakes down, tires, uh, engines, <laughs> transmissions, rear ends. All that stuff, it's just a its a snowball effect. And I think we talked a little bit about it on air yesterday. Um, you know, when I first started going to the track, you know, my, you know, my, my, my drive was to, you know, make the car faster, add horsepower, do yeah. this, and more, yeah. more, more. And it got to the point, um, you know, before I sold my Evo that, you know, I might have to travel to the track with 50 plus gallons of E85 to have enough for the weekend. <laughs> and I can tell you that that's, that's just silly. And driving cars that have 200 horsepower is every bit as much fun as driving cars with 500 horsepower uh, because the challenge is to be perfect. Right. And uh, it's it was my experience that um, a powerful car hides a lot of uh, driver 
um, deficiency. Right. Now, someone like Ferris, you might say, is, well, you know, all the horsepower and all the talent. So, like, well, good for him. Yeah, I like to I, I kind of like to argue your point there because, you know, you always talk about how, like, oh, in Sunday Cup, when you're in a, a fit or a Mazda 2 or whatever, um, if you scrub too much speed out of that or in a corner, it's going to affect you down the road. Uh, I mean, that affects Ferris, too. It's not like if he screws up corner entry that he can just push the gas pedal a little harder in the next straightaway and go a little faster to make up for that time. He's also losing that amount. It doesn't, I mean, uh, perfect driving is required regardless of where you're at in the scale of power or car development. Uh, I, I would agree, but I, say, I would say that as the horsepower number is reduced, um, the, the magnitude of that time differential gets bigger. Sure, but when you're chasing after the pointy end of the stick and you're chasing after class records and track records and uh, those records were set by very good drivers and very well-developed cars, uh, mistakes are mistakes, and time lost is time lost that you're not going to gain back. Absolutely, and I think uh, what we're seeing even within the Club TR group is that the records that are being set are very robust. And so now um, broken records is less common yeah does still happen but when it does happen it's really an achievement well i think um we talked about a little bit ago the progression of classes through the years uh so club tr new to this year what crazy things are you those guys going to find that you never thought of when you wrote that rule book uh that they're going to 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 do well, next year what's you know it's hard to say there's Adam no doubt I, in my mind that most you know the top five guys that are in that class that have been to quite a few events this year are reading every uh space between the rules in that rule book looking for more time for next year build season's coming it's not that far away you're right um actually uh, checkered flag on the session it looks like it's kind of a Kind so of a bum deal. Uh, it was because of Alex Moss's influence that a a wording, a very small wording, <laughs> got, got adjusted within the street mod rulebook. Yeah. Where uh, previously the rule uh, regarding um, wings in the rear of a street mod car said that uh, dual element wings were disallowed, and by his argument that meant that three element wings could be. <laughs> 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 and so the okay. word the word okay. had to be changed from dual to multi uh, and now we're now we're okay. I actually think that I caused a change in the rule book by pointing out a similar flaw in street class with super and turbocharging. Ah. Because uh originally what the way the wording was written when you guys had written that was that uh turbochargers had what is it originally like a 10 percent over factory limit i think yeah 20 20 whatever it is but superchargers were not in that bullet point in the rules interesting which meant that if you have a supercharger you could do whatever you wanted boost wise which meant that you and your cobalt ss might run really quick uh, but you already changed the wording on it so I let that slip without having the opportunity to I exploit it. I can say Adam and I call call these things sometimes. We call them Easter eggs. Yeah. And uh, Easter eggs may exist in the rule book, but probably not indefinitely. Right. So uh, sometimes the door is open on purpose just yeah. to see if someone will do it. <laughs> Who's paying attention? Um, but uh, you know, you might be lucky for an Easter egg to be there for a year or two. Right. There was a period of time in the track mod class that. Effective flat floors were allowed um, per the definition of the rules, uh, but that, that door has been closed because no one really took advantage of it. Uh, track mod's been an interesting class because there's not been that many fully developed track mod cars, sure. in my opinion. Um, you know, A lot of the cars that are here this weekend that are running track mod outside of Ferris are relatively uh, stock appearing cars. They're not wild arrow creations like most of the unlimited t class right. cars. Um, and I think track mod kind of ended up becoming a catch all. Kind of, yeah. For people who maybe aren't regular grid life competitors, so they didn't build their car to a rule book. 
Yep. And, you know, when, when I started in my Evo, the car wasn't built for uh, the street mod class. Practically, it was, we put it, to, or I put it together for for one lap of America. And it right. was when I started to get familiar with the rule book that I thought there was a lot of overlap. And right. so they, they just kind of shoehorn it into a series. Some of the cars now, though, the ones that are very competitive, tend to be focused on a particular class within a particular series. So yeah, even the, the street mod folks tend to be focused on street mod, but may also compete in other series, other events. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a few small rules in the street mod class that when the car is built to the very limit of the class, uh, kind of outlaws them from even switching over to um, global time attacks street class, what they call there, which is it's a very similar rule book, but... Uh, I think if I understand correctly, cars like Alex Moss's Super K, that's not legal in there because of that transmission that they have in that car, while being perfectly legal inside of the street mod rules, puts him in unlimited for, uh, or maybe not unlimited, maybe just limited for global time attack. I think that's right. And there are a few global time attack cars who uh, are very close to fitting in street mod but have dog transmissions, exactly. uh, which are currently not allowed in street mod. Correct. I know that uh, Amir, who has yeah. the NSX, which is a just a wonderful a car, monster of a car, um, has expressed interest in being able to join our events from time to time. Yeah. Uh, that car, as it sits, because of uh, a dog box uh, transmission, would be in the track mod, track mod group. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so he's talked about putting a more conventional transmission back in for grid life events. But... Um, you know, I think what we see is each series has just, um, you know, a few quirks um, that, that make it unique. And if a driver wants to be highly competitive in both classes, it's possible that they'll have to make some setup changes to run in any particular event to take the most advantage of the rulebook. It's, it's kind of funny to say this, but uh, changing a transmission isn't like the hardest thing in the world. It's really not. I mean, it does sound like a lot to a normal person, but at the level of prep those cars are at, changing a transmission isn't the end of the world. Uh, it's silly. GLTC driver Austin Hurdle, I think, has had his <laughs> transmission out here at the track more than once this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. He seems to be having a lot of trouble with that fourth gear. So, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, if, if you like – um, no one, I don't think, likes. I don't think anyone likes working on cars at the track. Uh, but setting up a car for a particular event, you know, you're you're probably going to have to do a little work. Yeah. So we're running now into Time Attack Group D cars being released from the false grid. Uh, I would imagine a lot of Sunday Cup cars in this group. And I know uh, one of our buddies, Andrew Rains, went out for a test drive in Matt Williams' fit yesterday. Oh, really? During one of the HPDE sessions. Yeah, okay. And was not able to best Matt Williams. Team. Oh, and Andrew former is, pro driver. Andrew huh? is a fast driver, but was not fast enough here. Snap. Uh, I talked to him quite a bit about his run in GLTC and stuff like that. And, and he's, he's talked about how frustrating uh, the – talent pool is here yeah in any series in, in any part of of grid life because clearly uh i mean he is he's a very fast driver in his own right spends a ton of time in the driver's seat a ton of time at the racetrack former uh world challenge competitor uh i believe even holds or held at the time some track records in that series uh and not being not being able to go out there and and beat you know amateur matt williams in his yep. own car so uh actually i was having conversation with a good buddy in the asm camp uh, zach lavoy uh -huh. who is a new addition to the gltc competition field this year okay and uh has had a, a bunch of experience racing wheel to wheel uh, in his region in the south and uh, he talked about you know, how he's used to being at the front top five regularly in the events that he has run historically. And uh, it was a real eye-opener coming into GLTC because now he's battling just to be in the top 20. And, and as we were talking about it, um, he and I both agreed that that's fine because uh, there's still great racing 
in, in, in that position, right? So you come to these events with the opportunity and, and the goal to do some racing. Right. And there is intense competition at every part of the field within GLTC. So even if you're in the back, you're still racing against competitors and having good battles. Yep. And so, you know, when you have drivers with consistent success uh, throughout a year, like Eric Cattell, Tom O'Gorman, Andy Smedegard, Aaron Lichty, and Jeremy Swenson, um, I think that's a real testament to their ability as drivers to be consistently running at the front in a field of really, really talented wheel-to-wheel -wheel racers. Joe out there in his Festiva. One of my favorite people in the paddock. Tom Holka coming through past start finish. Cars now on their uh, first hot lap. Festiva's getting it in the turn one. <laughs> Can you believe that that, of all things, outside of the power to wait for Sunday Cup, he's too fast for <laughs> Sunday Cup. <laughs> oh, jeez. He said, I would have to add a couple hundred pounds of ballast, which is just not a thing that somebody's going to want to do. Yeah, it's a lot. That looks... Oh, man. That's... <laughs> oh, no. Pretty dusty there as we wait for things to clear. Not sure if there was any on track contact, um, but definitely scary driving through that dust. That would be scary not knowing what's on the other side of that cloud uh, as you're coming out of a corner. Ooh. So it looks like yellow flag on course. Standing yellow. Black flag all. Not the cleanest time attack session we've ever had. No, definitely not. You know, sometimes um, when the conditions are right, I think there's uh, drivers will put additional pressure on themselves to go out and drive as hard as they can. Yeah. And um, sometimes it, it's, it's both, you know, those prime morning sessions and then the last session of the weekend is when you start to see people tend to overdrive. Well, and this is a really challenging track, too. Oh, Potentially some contact for the tire wall for that little Mazda. Glad to see the Mazdas out here in Sunday Cup, nonetheless. Finally having some variety in what was a uh, frustratingly fit-dominated class for me. It's hard to argue with the performance potential of the fit in the Sunday Cup. I still think that, you know, the Mazdas and, and the Mini Coopers, they've got the ability. That would be a standard Cooper because the Cooper right. S would be too Cooper much. Cooper S way too much. Got but it. a base Cooper... Uh, Kia Rio, Mazda 2, I think even maybe a base Veloster would be all right. Okay. Because I think that's basically just a Kia Rio. Uh, so it looks like um, a driver may have made contact on the left side and then uh, Came back crossed across over. The track, yeah. Some parts there that we believe might came, have come off that car. So hopefully he's all right. That's very, very fast that had to portion have been a of pretty the track. Hard hit to bring the car all the way back across the track like that. Yeah. Uh, at least, I mean, I hope the driver's all right. Yeah. Uh, he was in a group of cars that don't move that fast. <laughs> So uh, it's still a fast corner for sure, but uh, I, one of the things that I can say about driving a fit is that it's never really going so fast that braking quickly is a big concern. Yeah. So um, I would expect a little bit of cleanup here uh, as we roll into um, – It could we could see a checker in this session. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm a little interested to see that. So uh, – couple cars that we didn't really get to see much of that are in this session that I wanted to talk about. Eric Streeter here now, a uh, little bit of a late arrival in his Series 1 at Lotus, Lotus Elise. Elise. Now, uh, Eric has an affinity <coughs> for Lotuses. Yeah. Yes, I talked to him yesterday at length about Lotuses because I 
Well, I've never owned one, obviously. Really, really enjoy them as a as a brand. And just as a concept, um, right? Like yeah, this. super cool. Uh, there, he told me he he thinks that maybe one of five or six street legal series one Lotus releases that exist in the U.S. So uh, something to be said about this particular setup, this car in this f configuration. A few days ago, uh, Eric was in Europe on, I think, either a work trip or vacation. I he was he in was, Europe. He was there with his wife because he was telling me about and, it. And uh, uh. Uh, he was talking about potentially – that because he has a, a Lotus 7 that was down because of a mechanical, yeah, he's got he was a, talking a about camera. bringing his Elise. And um, he's, like street he's, class. he's in originally. Europe talking to me about whether he should run the Elise in street class. And I said, well, why not run it in Club TR? Yeah. Car fits. And uh, he's, he's in Paris at the time. Yep. And, uh, well, I just uh, – I'm apparently a pretty convincing person. <laughs> You're a bad person is what it is. I, I'm, you, I'm a bad influence on a lot of people. You and drug dealers have way too much in common. And uh, he told me that uh, he, he did some tire shopping, and the day before he left to return home, he placed an order with Tire Rack for some tires that would be legal for Club TR, that is the – the proper Falcon. size of the, the Falcon, Falcon RT660. Yep. They were at his doorstep when he returned home, and a, a day or two later, he's here at the track. He told me he was doing it while his wife was doing some, uh, like, gift shopping before they returned home, and he was kind of trying to, you know, not make it too obvious that he's sitting there on his phone buying car parts while he should be paying attention and, and focusing on the fact that he's on a vacation in <laughs> France. <laughs> Uh, you know, because you don't want to make her mad, you know, because that's the type of activity that is certainly going to trigger your wife <laughs> on vacation. Uh, but we quite honestly, we live in an amazing world. I think it was like 24 hours yeah. later. He had tires on his yeah. doorstep waiting for him. Yeah. Uh, talented driver in his own right. His uh, his Lotus 7, not very powerful, um, but consistently quick at Gingerman, certainly. Yeah. Super cool cars. He's got a hand, He's got quite a stable. Yeah, and I'm told he's building some another Lotus as well. Uh, two years ago now, or two events ago at Coda, uh, Adam Jabay in his trailer bought or brought home a um, like a unibody, uh, uh -huh. you know, just yep. the like the whatever it's called. It's an aluminum Can't even think of whatever. Yeah. Um, as the base for another race car for Eric. Yeah, I think he's building a 211 because didn't he try to make uh, a case to you and Adam about why that car shouldn't be stuck in Super Unlimited? That's the correct. 211? And he, he did so as if uh, he was making an appeal to the Supreme Court. <laughs> That's right. The document was There's formatted as an, official, That's right. uh, as an official document as if – they were writing to the actual Supreme Court. You know, if for no other reason than the effort he put forth doing that, I feel like you got to give the guy. You got to give it to him. Did you give it to of him? Of course we did. Oh, fantastic. Uh, it was incredibly well written. <laughs> Eric is a big nerd, and I he's love a, it. He's a brilliant person. And uh, it just, just literally made our day when we opened yeah. this and we saw how much effort he put into That's his art. That's hilarious. His so um, the the process for I, I don't want to say uh, we we don't really offer any allowances necessarily or we don't you know if a car is not legal for a class we don't tend to just let it or we don't let it slide ever yeah uh, and people aren't given a special waiver for any you know modification if Adam or I think it's fine that's not a thing right. that we do right uh, if a driver feels that something should or shouldn't be legal what they can do is submit an appeal to us and our advice is uh, pretend that you're a lawyer and argue your case yeah and it's our obligation um, we try also not to engage in what we think the rule says um, because we may have an opinion but arguably uh, we're not going to do the work for you right and so we tell people to pretend you're a lawyer and argue your case and if you are effective in your argument uh, that allowance or rule may be adjusted to fit your interpretation. And that's exactly what we saw with uh, Josh Holka a couple of years ago. Wasn't his argument essentially based around the fact that his engine is the same one that's in the S209, essentially? That, yes. And that uh, while he could just put that engine in the car with the turbo on it already, that seemed silly and, and pointless? 
Yes, and also um, practically there would n there would be no way to mechanically verify if the engine itself, the long block, was from That's an S two hundred nine versus just the turbocharger. So right. uh, the argument was um, an S two hundred nine is legal, right? And uh, kind of surprised we haven't seen one, honestly. Yeah, but they're expensive cars. Uh, and his argument was also Ooh. a swap <laughs> of an S two hundred nine engine into his car is also legal. Therefore. The turbocharger is legal. Yeah. Very well thought out. And uh, for a period of time, uh, there were some uh, boost restrictions uh, within street class um, that have been since changed to be a little bit more simple to manage for um, individual competitors, but also from a scrutineering, scrutineering point. standpoint. I always thought that was one of the hardest rules just as a guy reading the rule book that has to be one of the hardest rules for you guys to enforce and one of the easiest rules for someone who uh is willing to cheat to, to do break. certainly and uh, so uh for context what previously the rule stated was you were allowed 20 percent boost over factory but uh some of these higher performance additions of already high performance cars made administration of that rule really difficult, uh -huh. right? Because if if a standard Subaru STI has hypothetically a boost of, um, I don't know, 17 pounds from the factory, but uh, an, an RA has, I don't know, 21, and then an S209 has 24, right. um, you know, are you basing that number off of the highest possible number for a given chassis, or how do you administer that? And it became really difficult. And so uh, instead, what we did was set a limit on the amount of airflow that you can get from a turbocharger and also set an upper boost limit of 25. It's very easy to administer. Right. Uh, have you ever dealt with, and I, and I can't think of in the rule book um, if this is handled or not, like um, not like dealer specific, or dealer packages, but like um, dealer modified in the way like a Roush car, a Roush Mustang, say, or a Saline Mustang, I think even, because those are cars that come from the factory as Mustangs. And then you like uh, the Ford dealership in the town I live in is a Roush uh, dealer. And so they can take those cars and they can modify them uh, with the Roush packages. Uh, how do you how do you handle cars like those? So uh, the way we describe it in the uh, larger portion of the rule book, and then more specifically in some of the classes, things like uh, Roush and Celine and other APR big yeah. modifiers of yeah. cars, um, all of those are compliant within the rule book. There are some provisions against um, some of those. Uh, niche dealer modifi uh, modified cars. Right, like, like you can only get it at, at this one dealer in some random town in Ohio. And it's, you know, you're for, for an extra seven grand, you get a thousand horsepower GT <laughs> Mustang. Those are disallowed okay. uh, because those are not, you know, large manufacturers of aftermarket right. parts. Right. And so uh, things like the, the Roush and Celines, yeah, definitely. We see a lot of those. And uh, APR cars as well. Um, and uh, they tend to fit really nicely, actually, in a lot of our run groups. So rolling back out on a track, but we're pretty far into this session already. Not sure if they're even going to get uh, a warm-up and a flyer out of this. Really kind of a disappointing deal for a lot of these competitors, I'm sure. But, um, you know, you get, get more chances later on in the day. Um, really just, I think there's some strategy in just making sure that uh, you make the session work for you. Yeah. And, you know, if if you're trying to make this session the one that you bank, uh, there's an opportunity to go out, do your warm-up, and pull back into the pits and wait for the wave of cars to go around track. And if you wait 10 or 15 seconds, what you have is an entirely clean side of the track uh, where there is nobody, where you get a lap or two at least, uh, where you are completely unobstructed. Yeah. So uh, it's 11.21. This is scheduled to end just just about right here with, um, excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, 11.25, the beginner run group is scheduled to go out. Yeah. So I would imagine here maybe one hot lap. Um, otherwise, I don't, yeah, we only have one time on the board. So, you know, hopefully race control 
can at least give them the amount of time that they need to get at least one, one lap yep. in this session. Um, just so it's not a total scratch. So this creates kind of an interesting uh, thought for me. So, like, when a lot of times when I, at least with my local autocross region, um, car classes are grouped together so that uh, everybody who's competing in a specific class is competing on as similar a surface at the time as possible. So, like, say you've got a raining day that is moving to drying. If I'm in class and another competitor is in the same class, uh, but he ran in a different session. He might have a wetter or drier sure. course. Um, now, obviously, the way that you guys grid these cars is purely based on time uh, and not on class. Uh, I'm surprised that no one's ever, like, argued the unfairness of, like, well, my session got scrubbed, but my competitor, who's just a small amount ahead of me, his didn't. Well, uh, in in that environment, you'd hope that things average out. You get yeah. a number of attempts in a given weekend. That's I think fair. this weekend, I think there are eight hot sessions for Time Attack. Yeah. Um, the, the law of averages, I think, comes into play where uh, you know everyone gets a decent number of attempts, even though it might not buy, be identical for every competitor. But the argument for uh, sorting by time is exclusively driven by safety. Yeah, I think in that I think the safety of it vastly outweighs. But I, I, you know, I could see I could see an argument uh, from a competitor just even if it's just in, out of frustration. Oh, certainly. Um, in this case, I mean, even takes street class for an example. I imagine that you have you know Halka running 133s, but I would not be surprised to see some street class cars, newer drivers into Time Attack running in the low 150s. And right. that speed differential, um, if you were running by class, presents um, kind of a dangerous scenario on track that you'd hopefully uh, try and avoid. Sure. But I can see where someone might say, uh, like in the street or the club TR classes, those guys, uh, their times as based on, on the averages of everybody else, a lot of times they're, they could be split between the back of one run group and the front of the next. And so, like, I might be chasing, I might be half a second behind the guy in front of me, and he's just fast enough to be in the run group before me, you know. Yeah, it's so. it's hard to say. We haven't had It is what it is, I mean. Looks like we're taking checker here now. I would expect, yeah, drivers did get uh, at least one lap coming through here right now. Uh, just enough to do one. Matt Williams with a 151, 289. Yeah, I, I think, think again, that's, that's another record. I think that's fast, but my phone died. So uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how fast it is. I'm going to pull up these records. You know he did that just to really drive the point home to Andrew Raines that uh, Matt is better. Well, in, in a fit, Matt is better. <coughs> so the record I have from uh, before the start of this weekend was a 51.777. He did so go faster than that by just a small margin yesterday. So a 51.289. Kudos. Yeah. I don't know if that's faster than yesterday, but it is uh, faster than the previous weekend. Yeah, record. competition in Sunday Cup heating up. I think drivers are looking at that rule book, starting to wonder what they can do to try and get a little bit more pace out of these cars while remaining compliant within the rules as written. What I think is really cool, I talked about I'm in the, the Sunday Cup group chat, and those guys are always, they're sharing setup, they're sharing ideas. Somebody posted a picture of a, a, some pretty extreme tire wear and like, oh, what am I doing wrong here? You know, and, and everybody's like, oh, I run these pressures. I run this camber. Like they're all, um, even at the, at the potentially the sacrificing of their own competitiveness, they're willing to help everybody else to be fast. Yep. Um, it's, it's a really fun class. Um, um, I don't know. It's just a community of like, quirky I, people that I do think that that exists uh, in almost every time attack class here the difference the biggest difference I think between Sunday Cup and the uh, some of the other classes is that most of them are the same chassis yep and so they can share setup between each other and it actually makes it like you know uh, Ferris can share setup with uh, Kendall Samuel 
but that doesn't matter to each other because right. they're in such dramatically different cars, even though they're in the same class. Absolutely. So uh, I think with the conclusion of Time Attack Group D, uh, we're going to step away for just a bit as, and we will uh, hear a word from our, our partners and uh, GLTC will back uh, be back here shortly. Thanks for watching. Today's coverage of Gridlife's Track Battle Time Attack is being brought to you by Falcon Tire. Competition, proven performance. 303 performance. Premium protectants and cleaners exceeding expectations since 1980. Stable, ready, willing, stable. Momo, the official safety partner of Gridlife. And by HP Tuners. HP Tuners, connect, read, edit, write, and drive.
We've been powering the American road since before it was paved. Our first breakthrough in motor oil was introducing it. And we've been reinventing it ever since. From the world's first high mileage oil to the world's first synthetic blend. There are those who change with the times and those who drive them. Valvoline, the original motor oil. The Falcon Azenus RT660 is the enthusiast's choice for ultra-high performance. Engineered for predictable handling and stability, the RT660 provides maximum traction both on and off the track. Your competitive edge has arrived with the Falcon Azenus RT660. Hawk Performance packs 100 years of friction dynamics into every product. Backed by Carlisle Brick and Friction, the world's premier innovator of industrial brake and friction components, Hawk leverages R&D tools and motorsports experience to deliver uncompromising performance on the street. There's no reason to settle for less. Choose pads that are race proven and street legal. Find the Hawk Performance Brake Dealer near you at hawkperformance.com. Here at FCP Euro, we take pride in the fact that each and every one of your orders is picked, packaged, and shipped by a fellow car enthusiast. We understand that you need the right parts and need them fast to complete that next project or get your daily driver back on the road. Take Roberto, one of the pickers in the distribution center and one of the key pieces to making sure the right parts arrive at your door. When he's not at FCP Euro, Roberto is driving his Mark V R32 to various car shows around the Northeast. When he's picking orders, he puts himself in your shoes and understands that you need the right parts to arrive at your door. So he takes the utmost care in making sure he puts the correct items in the box. To learn more about us, head to fcpero.com. We are at an absolutely beautiful Mid-Ohio sports car course. It is Grid Life Touring Cup action continuing. We are getting set for the top 10 shootout, making its return to this championship here at Mid-Ohio in this seventh round here at the Midsummer Meet. And what's going to be fascinating about this, top 10 cars finishing order from race two. They line up. They will determine the order now for the top 10 in race three with single car qualifying for the top 10. It should be spectacular. I'm Greg Creamer, Alex Moss alongside, and we are getting ready to set this one on its way here. We're really excited about this because to see these cars out one at a time and the way the format works, Alex, first car goes out, does a warm-up, then a flyer, and then done, then the next car goes, right? That's right. So each car is going to go out, get an opportunity to see the track all to themselves, no traffic, no other cars on the on the track. They get to set that one lap time from a, f uh, a, from a flying lap. Um, and that's going to determine where they start in the top 10 of the grid. And that'll be done reverse order from how they finish. So 10th place will go out first, working their way up to the guy who won the race. That's right, yep. So it really build the, the excitement and the anticipation to see if Eric Cotill is going to be able to hang on to that pole position. Um, he will know what everyone's done, or we will know what everyone else has done when he sets his time. And the two guys to me that have real opportunity here would be one, uh, Jeremy Swenson in that big, powerful Corvette, he comes from the time attack background. That's what they do is just run qualifiers, right? That's right. Time attack is essentially a, a qualifying session. Um, so the, the drivers that have a good time attack background, in theory, should have a, a, a be very experienced in this format and, and know how to attack it. And this corner right here, when we get ready for this, is going to be absolutely crucial. And we'll talk about that in a second here. Let's take a look at the uh, track map of what these guys are going to be dealing with. And when they set off, they will start the clock right where that dot is, essentially. Fastest turn on the track, blind turn in under that bridge. Big commitment corner there. At the exit, it actually climbs a little bit, so you get more grip than you think you will. Then this huge run, and you better get the keyhole right on this qualifier. That's right. Yeah, getting the keyhole right and getting the exit to the keyhole right is imperative because that leads you on to a long period of full throttle where any mistake, you're going to carry that mistake all the way to turn four. And if you get behind in turn four and five, your lap's done. You've got to be on top of it, uh, be on your game. And then here in turn 12, 
the, the the qualifying lap actually will start before the apex at 12, won't it? That's right. So the, the time starts at the start-finish line there that you can see, but the actual qualifying run begins before that last corner. So, and so coming up right here, they're just, you know what are they going to do here? Yeah, so on the, the they're going to take this turn differently on their warm-up lap compared to their flying lap. The warm-up lap, the drivers are going to try to maximize the miles per hour that they can have when they cross that timing line. So they will take a wide line, they'll maximize the distance, give themselves the most acceleration. At the end of the run, they're not trying to maximize the, the miles per hour across the line, they're trying to minimize the time from that corner to the line. So they're going to shave distance out of it, try to carry more speed, and get to that line sooner. So into 12, they're going to go in really wide, just make diamond it huge, really. Just do a hard right um, up in the center of your screen right there. They're going to run way wide, then get on the hammer, right, that to start the qualifier. Then they'll drive the normal race line at the end of it, as you said, just a roll speed through that corner. Yep, exactly. Okay. So we'll see two very different lines, especially from those time attack drivers. Well, it's going to be fun to watch. And the other guy I was just talking about, the two guys that, to me, have opportunity. We talked about Swenson. He's a time attack guy. He gets it, knows what to do. For me, Andy Smedegard, after the issue in race one with the contact uh, that he had and the fact that uh, he ended up finishing way, way back, he did get a decent lap in, but he got a grid penalty, so he was outside of the top ten. Right now, if he can lay down a great lap, in this session, he can get himself back on track. Literally, he can get back up toward the front where we know he can he can race. Yep. Yeah, this shootout is great for him. He snuck into the top ten at the last race, so this is his chance to reset and, and put those troubles behind him now in the weekend. The other thing we got to talk about is uh, I think these guys are just out in their warm-up laps yep. right now. But the other thing we, uh, we have to talk about is at the end of that second race, the first one today, uh, we had uh, DJ Alessandrini beating Jeremy Swenson to the line and taking that fifth spot actually wasn't the case. Explain why. Right. So we have um, a, what's called a transponder on the car that's mounted on the car. And the, when that transponder crosses the line, that's what triggers timing. On DJ's car, that was at the front of on the front bumper of his car. On Jeremy's car, it was at the back. So with a little overlap, uh, his DJ's transponder crossed first, even though he was a little bit behind on track. So they did reverse that officially, so all things are right again. And we are watching Smetagard on his flyer and really aggressive using the curb at turn one, way up on the curb there in the keyhole and looking for drive down the long. This is the only dyno run you really have here. And uh, getting out of this and up next, it's going to be that section called Madness. And as I said, you've got to be on your game through there, up on the wheel and not get behind because it's just going to cost you time. Let's see how he looks through here, Alex. Yeah, looking good so far. Um, the pressure's really on for them on this because they only get one shot at this, one opportunity. Any mistake is going to really ruin it for them. So they've got to perform to try and gain those positions, but also be a little bit safe and make sure that they don't lose any. Good aggressive run through there. Maybe a little wide down at the bottom of six, but not too bad. Now heading toward the big jump right here. Car just falls away. Nicely done there. Used up a good amount of that exit curb. Now the run through Thunder Valley and heading into that crucial carousel. And now it's time to drive the normal racing line, flow as much speed as you can. So he stays tight to the right there, floats out just a little bit to get the car rotated onto that apex curb, onto the hammer. Here we go. Let's see what kind of a time he puts up. This will be the reference point. Checker flag comes out, and Smetagard flies through a 137.352. So that's the marker that everybody is going to be looking at here. And I'm really excited to see the next guy come out, Scott McGee here in his 93 Mazda RX-7. And Scott, this is his first race in Grid Life Touring Cup, and all he's done is put up two top ten finishes on debut here. It's pretty impressive stuff, an eighth yesterday and a ninth this morning. Yeah, really impressive for his first uh, weekend here. I can't imagine what the nerves are like um, <laughs> coming into your, your first wheel-to-wheel uh, -wheel race and having to battle with all these very experienced competitors, but he's certainly been holding his own and, and putting up a good show for us. This is some fierce stuff, too, this, this uh, Touring Cup racing. Okay, here we go. There's that really, really wide arc. Now you turn it down to the apex and get the hammer down as he starts. His flyer, a little wide of the apex right there, uses up all that exit curb as he is now on the clock. Watch him into turn one. Here's that blind approach because of that bridge. Little bobble of the car there right at the apex, it looked like, but he gathered it up and held it together. 
Now, here's the run into that absolutely crucial keyhole once again. And you want to come in about mid-track. Nice approach right there. Leave it out just a little bit. Now start to feed it down to the apex. You want a late apex, it is what it's called. So then you can unwind the wheel and get to the throttle a little bit sooner and run everything you can down this long back straight. And you also, at the when you get to turn four on a flyer, uh, a single car fly, flyer, you're going to run way wide into four because you can make up a lot more ground carrying your speed right through here and take it all the way to driver's left. Beautiful line there. Because this next set of corners, a lot slower. You don't traverse as much ground at speed. Yeah, and, and what you said is true. You might take a different line when you're just purely going for a lap time versus in a race because that wide entry, while it may let you carry some more speed, leaves you a little bit vulnerable for somebody poking their nose in there and, and getting that position that you then have to leave them and, and getting past you. You can see a little twitch right there between turn 8 and 9. I don't know that it was going to cost him too much. Now up through 11 and into that crucial carousel. And the line here now, he's going to keep it tucked a lot tighter in. He's going to diamond it a little bit here. All right, here he comes. The marker, a 137.352, as we said. Onto the front straight comes McGee. What does he put up for a time? A 139.173. So a little bit off, about 1.8 seconds off of Smedegard. And you may have that, we have, as you said, a little bobble in one, a little bobble in eight and nine. Now, Ryan Upham is out, and you'll notice he's in a car that's a little bit different color. Uh, he, his team runs two cars here, Ryan's and Lewis Chat Troops, and they had a problem in both cars, and Ryan's a bit higher in the points, and so they cobbled together the two cars, and he's making this one right now, and he is now on the clock and starts his lap running the gray BMW instead of the red one he normally does. And this is an 04 M3. Love the sound of those straight sixes. Yeah, so Ryan um, and the owner of this car each had individual problems with their cars, it sounded like, in the last race. Uh, so they've got together and, and kind of combined their parts and made one good car out of two bad cars. And uh, Ryan's continuing the race here with that. And you saw that really wide entry into the keyhole. That's what I would expect most people to do, as we said, to get that car rotated and be able to unwind the wheel, which allows you to get more aggressive onto the power and do it earlier. Now we'll watch him down this back straight and into and through turn four. Nice and late on the brakes, but not scrubbing off too much speed. He gave up a little bit more on the exit there four than I would have thought. But you can see him. Ooh, bit of welly there, a little bit of a slide. Yeah, and this is, this is a new uh, car for him. Obviously, it's not his normal car, so right. he's obviously learning that chassis and that setup a little bit as he goes here. A um, little unfortunate this is his first try. Yeah, that's a, yeah. you don't get any practice here before the shootout other than the race, and he was in a different car in the race, so he's just feeling his way around here. Here he comes now, up through turn 11. Another blind turn in as you climb. You don't really see the exit of the track. Oh, it looks like he is caught. That's uh, unfortunate. The on his cooldown lap. Yeah. Don't like to see that. Let's see what he does for a time. 139.1. One. Uh, 137.9. Oh, excuse me. I looked at the wrong one. I went through. Yeah, that's not a bad lap at all in terms of time. And there were a couple of spots where he was just a little bit wide. I think he could have done even better. I think he'll be pleased with that considering it was his first time out in that car. Yeah, yeah, just actually just seven tenths behind his yeah. um, first qualifying session that he ran. Um, so he's probably going to be pretty happy with that. Here comes Luke McGrew, who in the first two races of the weekend has moved up three spots in the points in his number seven. Uh, Mazda Miata, that's a 2007 entry. And Luke, uh, as we talked about previously about maybe making setup changes for the shootout, and, and we didn't maybe expect to see that, Luke actually did make some ch setup changes. So okay. he has removed the front splitter on his car, um, removing some of that, that aero performance from it. And that's allowed him to reduce the weight of his car then. Uh, he, he could take another 80 pounds out of the car to try and improve his performance. Oh, there you go. And, you, and he might miss the stick, but even the splitters create a little bit of drag. So he's probably playing that game too. Watch his line through four, floats it all the way out. Beautiful run there for Luke. A couple of wins already this season. Started off really well, led the uh, early part of the season in terms of the points, 
and is still right up in the mix. Yeah, and he has that Duratec motor in this car, and he has gone through a bunch of them um, <laughs> as he's lost those engines uh, over the past couple of seasons with grid life. There he goes through the jump over at turn nine. Looks like he's got a pretty decent lap going here. In the yeah. race earlier this morning, he started up in the top four, dropped back a few spots. I think it was Aaron Lecty just got around him and bottled him up a little bit. Let's see what he puts in. Final set of corners here through the carousel, through the flick, through turn number 13 here. What does he put up for a time? Where does he go? McGrew to the pole. A 136-155. That is a superb lap. 1.2 seconds quicker than Smedegard. Yeah, great lap from Luke there. He's got to be happy with that. Uh, it's a little bit slower than his uh, initial qualifying time, uh, but he made those setup changes, and, and the track just may be slower right now. That could be. We've had a lot of activity out there in terms of time attack cars and a couple of cars that had some mechanical issues, so there could be some stuff down on the track. Here we go. DJ Alessandrini out of Cleveland, Ohio. He knows this place. Had the problem in the race yesterday, but rebounded after he had run a really quick lap before he got taken out yesterday. Uh, started in fourth, finished in a fighting sixth. This is an opportunity for him. Boy, uses up every bit of road at the exit of one. Yeah, I think he scores high on your commitment meter on that one. <laughs> yes, he does. When you see a little puff of dust come off from the back edge of the curb, you know you're right on the limit. But he tucked it in really early there into the keyhole. And uh, that is an approach that some will use sometimes. We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, if you don't have a ton of power in the car and you're not traction limited on the exit, it may, be, may make sense to shave distance through there rather than trying to maximize the, the exit. Um, we'll see. It's all, all the, the compromise and balance for what you give up to what you can gain. And sometimes, yeah, you shave distance and just roll speed if you don't have big horsepower, right? Right, exactly. Here he goes. Ooh, a little lift up on the top, and I think that was more just to get the car, the little weight on the nose to get the car to turn better. Using up everything down at the bottom is six, up over the first jump there at seven. And now into eight and then nine. Here he goes through turn nine. There you get a little sense of how it drops. You could just see that right there. And now the blast through Thunder Valley. Yeah, nine, for me, the most exciting part of this track. I love driving through that. Yeah, it is something, isn't it? All right. He's got to beat a 136-1 by Luke McGrew. And his uh, earlier qualifying time was a 35-3, so we should see how generally we'll see qualifying time stack up here. All right, here he comes. Does he do what he does? A 135-7-8-4. First one into the 135s. You nailed it. He showed what he could do. Yeah, absolutely. All right, here should be some fun. This is the man, and I got to give a shout-out. Moorhead, Minnesota, I grew up 45 miles uh, east of there and had a very – well, not very productive first year of college at Moorhead, uh, <laughs> at Moorhead State University. So, but it's a place I'm familiar with. And this is Jeremy Swenson in the big 2001 thundering Chevy Corvette. And like you said, he really diamonded that uh, turn 12 run. Here we go through turn one. This is the time attack guy going after it. Yeah, very clean through turn one, um, as we'd expect from Jeremy. And a very, very good driver here. Uh, he has the street tires on, so he should you know, not be dealing with tire temperature issues or anything like that, that maybe some of the Hoosier power guys are. They switch on a little bit quicker, don't they? In terms they of do, yeah. The Hoosiers up. can take, you know, maybe a couple of laps to warm up and, and really be come into their peak, uh, whereas these street tires should be ready to go right from the start. And this Corvette has just immense and consistent torque, which will really help as he gets down now into turn four, winning his driver on the season with five of them so far. Just nabs a little bit Ooh. on the curb, a little bit of rotation there. I don't think that's going to hurt him too much. Feeding the there is a nice little drift as well. He's just trying to get that back end around so we can get it pointed in the right direction. Nice, yeah. not beautiful through six. Yeah, he's really wheeling that car, really throwing it around, trying to get all of the time out of it for this qualifying session. Here's if that turn into the jump over at nine. Great line through there, and now feeding it through Thunder Valley. Mm -hmm. Just love the sound of that car. Up he comes. Just a couple more corners. 135, 784. See if he can uh, jump to the top here. Do the last corner onto the front straight. There's the flag stand. And he does a one minute 35, 2, 5, 2, and goes to the top. Great lap by Swenson. Time attack. 
That's paying off. Yep, and he is actually the first guy to beat his qualifying time that we can see just by almost half a tenth of a second from his uh, initial qualifying time. All right, here comes the other V8 in the field. This is the uh, V8 LS wedged into the front of a Scion FRS. This is Eric Jensen in the 184. It's a 2016 Scion FRS. And uh, he's got a podium on the season and was really racy earlier today, biting that car up into the fourth spot. So great opportunity for him to get a good starting position out of this now. Yeah, he's been uh, coming on strong all weekend, qualified initially um, right around 11th um, with a 136. Um, so hopefully looking to him. Well, he has to improve on that. The worst he can do is 10th. Yeah, so he, he's improving his position with these t with the shootout. Well, he, he, and you know when you have a great race right before the shootout, that's going to give you the confidence. And you know that, all right, the car's working. Let's see what can happen here. Watch him. You got a bunch of that curb, but it didn't seem to unsettle him too much. And the one thing to keep in mind in this shootout, any rewards weight you may have earned during the weekend, it, you can take it all off. So, you know, the guys that finished up near the front aren't going to be carrying an extra 100 pounds or anything. They're going to be as close to the minimum as they can. That's right. They're going to be in full qualifying trim, uh, trying to set the absolute fastest time. Yeah, the rewards weight gets to come off. Boy, did he, he used up every bit of curbing at the apex there in nine. That was really, really good. You know, if it's paved, get onto it. And he used it to great effect here, floating now up through 11. It's just so counterintuitive, isn't it, to hear that big V8 thunder out of that Scion. But he's it giving is, it yeah. a good wheel here. <laughs> here he goes. Ooh, a little bit early on turn in at, at 12, and that may have cost him just a bit. Where does he come through fourth. in fourth? Yeah, fourth with a 136.3, um, just three tenths off his previous time. So a good run for him. Next out will be the point leader. Well, he was coming into the weekend. Check this out. He is now second by one point. <laughs> and the top three in points came in here nine points apart. The top three are now seven points apart. So it's just mega competitive. This is the 2014 Porsche Cayman in the hands of Aaron Lechte, the number 190. Three wins this year. Finished second in the championship last year. He switched between this car and a Mazda as the season unfolds. And he likes running this car here. And this lap is about to start. Yeah, in the last race, he got to actually managed to um, help Eric Cotill pass Tom O'Gorman for the lead, um, either through a little bit of a nudge or more likely just from, from that reverse draft and, and helping power Cotill down the straight into turn four. An arrow nudge. Yes, an arrow <laughs> nudge. <laughs> All right, let's watch him up into the keyhole. Yep, that mid-track entry, floating it a little wide, then down and get on the power. And uh, this is a heavier car. Woo, drops the lefts at the exit. This is a little heavier car, but it's got a little bit more motor, too, than others, and it gets down this straight in a hurry. It's very slippery, too. Yeah, yeah, but using all the track at the exit of two there, um, kicking up some dust, he's really going for it. All right, deep into four. Correcting the car on entry. Yeah, that <laughs> was really, really bad. Bad. And out of four, feeding throttle all the way up to the top at five. So he's trying to get every ounce of speed out of it here. Beautiful line down through the bottom of six. Up over that first little rise into seven. There's eight. Here's the jump at nine and into Thunder Valley. A 135.2 provisional pole right now by Swenson by a half second over Alessandrini. Ooh, got that curb. Loosen the car up. Drops the rights off into the grass. That might be his lap. Yeah, that's where we see some of that pressure of having yep. to get it done in one lap and having to pour it, perform in one lap. Made a little, just a tiny error there, getting that curb early, and it pushed him off track. And he ends up in six at a 137.7, and you got to believe that one that slide as he turned into 11 and then bouncing through the grass, that could have been a second, even two, and that would have put him right into the 35. So that's got to hurt. Defi definitely made a huge impact on his lap, no doubt. Next up, the guy who's been second twice already this weekend, Tom O. Tom O'Gorman driving for ASM Motorsports in the number 94 Honda S2000. And he comes from Mason, Ohio. This is home track. He is fast around here. 
Yep, I got to drive all the way from Wisconsin to uh, mid-Ohio with Tom, and he was just bouncing the whole way. He was so <laughs> excited to get here. Uh, so excited to bring the rest of us who've never been here to this track as well. And look at how wide he ran as you talked about through turn 12. He posted a Get Around Mid-Ohio video on YouTube for everybody, giving away all his secrets, but that's the kind of guy he is. But he used that line in 12 to absolute perfection to get the launch here. Look at that, every ounce of road on the exit, just flowing speed. Yeah, you can tell he knows his way around this place in a number of different cars. Up and into the keyhole, again, mid-track. Patience, now go to the throttle. You don't want to get, because it, it falls away there, and if you go to throttle too early, you just push. So you've got to have something that drivers don't have a lot of, and that's patience. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> For that first little bit through that corner, now it's the big run. And he has been just breathtaking to watch here through turn four and into uh, the madness section of the track. Watch him here. Oh, missed the apex yeah. there a little bit. Got a little bit of push mid-corner, it looked like. Using the throttle to help steer the car. Watch him wrap that curb. His line through there is something. All right. Everybody, you, you do tend to run a little wide there through eight because to turn a little tighter, you'd end at pinch speed. Ooh, drops his lefts at the exit of the jump. I, I don't know that it, I don't know that he lifted though. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that will have cost him too much time. He was straight by the time he he did that. I think he would have just stayed in it and carried it. And here we go up and through that last corner. You can see the very different line. This is now the run and carry speed through it. He's got to beat a 35-2. Can he do it? He comes to the line. Where does O'Gorman go? Ooh, a 136-2, only good for fourth. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, surprising. Maybe that, that where he dropped off the line uh, did hurt him a little bit. It did, it did. And we just got an update, by the way. Ryan Upham, if you remember, he ran up on the back of, uh, I think it was McGee, and uh, so they have uh, clarified they are going to give up him a run once our uh, last guy gets out, who now, by one point, is the point leader. He came in here third in the points in two races. Eric Coutil has jumped into the point lead, not by a lot, but uh, a nice run. A 92 Honda Civic SI, and man, does he get that thing around this place fast. Yes, yes he does. He was our fastest qualifier in traditional qualifying by uh, just about tenth of a second. Uh, I'd expect him to be very, very fast in this lap as well. Out of Columbus, Ohio, knows this track well, certainly has won both of the races from pole, as you said, already this weekend on a stellar run. It was his fourth win. Nice line through turn one. See what his approach here up into the keyhole. Not a big horsepower car. He gives it maybe a car width. Not as much as some we've seen, but it gets on that curb a little bit more, and that's just trying to shorten the distance, isn't it? Yep, that's exactly right. That car, he wants to shave the distance out of it. Another thing we saw there is he was coming into turn two, and you saw this a couple of times during the race. Just saw a little flash of brake lights way before the braking zone. What he's trying to do there is make sure that those brake pads are pushed up against the brake rotors, and he knows that the pedal's going to be there when he goes to it. Nice, nice. Just nicked that curb. Actually just helped him. Ooh, bit of rotation there, but he's done that all the time. That's just his line through there. Get that back to swing around. Yeah, kept the line well. Still made the apex. I, I don't think that was a mistake, actually. No, no. And, you know, with a front drive car, you sometimes set that rear end up to be a little loose just to help you get turned because front drive cars tend to have a little inherent push, don't they? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So driving it absolutely beautifully here. A 135-252, can he beat that? Beautiful line through 11. And and you can see the difference there between his line and Aaron Lichty's line was just a few inches different. Yep. But he made the, got over the curb nicely, whereas Eric, it bounced him off. It did, here we go. Does he do it? No, Swenson hangs on by a tenth of a second. Kutil sits second at a 135-32, Swenson at a 135.25, about as close as it can be. Yes, yes it is. And now uh, we're going to see Upham here, who's going to get his uh, consolation lap after he caught the, the Mazda on the slowdown lap. So he will get one chance to get it done here. And this is a real benefit for him because now he knows he, he had no lap before his just the warm-up lap. Now he's got one hard lap he was able to throw in. He already ran that line in 12 a bit differently. Yep. 
Yeah, but I think this could really help him now. I, I would agree. Now he's he hadn't seen this car at speed um, before his first lap. Now he's got at least one flying lap under his belt. So I think he'll be kind of uh, thankful for his misfortune <laughs> on catching that slow car. Every once in a while, bad things happen, and it turns into a good opportunity. A 137.9 was the lap he turned previously. And see if he's going to be able to better that. Looked pretty darn good there through the keyhole. Yeah, he's looking much more comfortable already. Yes. Yeah. It'll really give us an idea here into the braking zone, turn in and exit a four now. He's got himself a little bit of a handle on the car. Turning it in. A little wide of the apex there. Gave himself room on the exit. A little twitchy, oh. though, way wide. Yeah, maybe pushing just a little too hard in this car. Trying yep. to get it done on this lap. Oh, oh, big slide and saved it, but that'll be the lap. Now, this will be interesting. Do they? This this lap will almost certainly be slower than the previous lap he set. Um, Absolutely. And which one is going to count now uh, for the result? Does he Does he lose the previous lap? Oh, he may have a problem. Yeah, I wonder if he's got a tire that's always oh, leaking something. Something's yep. leaking out that's of that car. That's fluid. So he got, uh, yeah, maybe had fluid on his tire yeah. there as he came that, down. Yeah, that looks like oil on sure the track does. there. So I wonder if, uh, oh, no. if something's happened to that. Well, something's clearly happened to that car. Right, and I mean, he had a clutch problem in his car, a coolant issue in the other in this car. Yeah, and I they wonder. sort of cobbled them together here so he could have a car to go after it. And to have another mechanical problem crop up has got to be frustrating. Yeah, that's an unfortunate uh, way to end his qualifying session. But as we talked about bad things being fortunate, a uh, lot better this happens on uh, one lap qualifying when you have the track to yourself rather yes. than in the next race. If he hadn't got that extra lap, whatever has failed would have failed during the race and, and affected you know the other 39 cars that were out there. So once again, something unfortunate happening that turned into a you know, possibly a bit of a blessing here. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's a shame. That is a real shame. And I would suspect, I mean, if, if they give you another lap, another lap, one would suspect at that point, folks, that they would delete that first lap because that, you know, everybody else didn't get two opportunities. That, so that's what we would think, but we haven't had clarification right. on that yet, Alex. That, that's what I would expect. My guess is that, that this was an, an, a situation that wasn't hadn't been foreseen and they kind of had to call an audible on this. I don't know that for sure. That may, they may have this contingency in place. Um, so, yeah, I think I think we're going to find out here later what, what the outcome of this is, has been. But it may be all moot based yes. on yeah. what's happened to that car. That's a good point. And for Andy Smedegaard, we were talking about the opportunity. One, even though he's from Wisconsin, uh, hard to believe he's never raced here before, hasn't been here before. So he's, he's dealing with that just a little bit. Um, but did you have a sense that maybe he didn't get everything out of that lap too? Uh, yeah, I think so. He was a lot further off his pace um, than his previous qualifying lap. Now, he did have that contact um, in the, the first race. So the car may be compromised still yeah. um, based on that and not handling quite as well as it could. Um, as far as not being here before, he's had you know a practice session, a qualifying session, two races now. I think he would be the first person to say that after that amount of time, he's got this place figured he's got out. It figured out. Yeah, it's a track that's got lots of nuance to it, folks. It's a driver's track, really technical. We talked about the blind approaches and turn-ins, and all of that. But a driver of his caliber doesn't take that long to figure any track out, especially. He's a teammate with O'Gorman, so you know he's pouring over that video and picking his brain as well. So uh, That's right. But we did get it right about Swenson, man. What a lap he yep. threw down. Yeah, incredible, really. He did uh, He did really, really well. And I think he's the only person who beat his previous qualifying lap. So, yeah, that's uh, – and, again, you want to do well in single-car qualifying in uh, Grid Life Touring Cup, spend a little time in time attack, folks. That's yeah. going to get it right. So, my friend, if you end up racing Touring Cup next year, I expect nothing but poles, baby. Uh, we'll see about that. We but are, no pressure. We no are pressure. building a car for me uh, for <laughs> maybe next year. Um, I'm hoping to just go have fun uh, mid-pack. I'll have a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's the, that's the key to anything with Grid Life is fun first, competition second and we've seen it play out here but both of them have been absolutely pinging and after the race we saw this morning when we come back next folks for grid life touring cup it will be about two o'clock so join us about 145 we will be teeing things up for race three of four on the weekend and we now have our entire field set this set the top 10 11 through the back 
already had been set from the finishing order of race two, race three coming up. But we're heading into a lunch break. Then we'll be back. We've got some time attack, short sessions coming at you. Then Grid Life Touring Cup race three. So make sure you come back. It's an absolutely beautiful day here at Mid-Ohio. It's all part of the Grid Life Midsummer Meet. Today's coverage of the Grid Life Touring Cup is brought to you by FCP Euro. Every part you buy is guaranteed for life. Falcon Tire, competition proven performance. Momo, the official safety partner of Grid Life. Hawk Brakes, race proven, street legal. And Valvoline, Valvoline VR1, available at Advanced Auto Parts stores.